Next, HUD's funding of a 1995 public housing conference in Puerto Rico. Congressman Christopher Shea's panel held a hearing Thursday to look into the agency's role in the meeting sponsored by the National Tenants Organization. HUD spent $300,000 on the conference. I'd like to call this hearing to order and I would first like to apologize to our witnesses for the delay in starting because of the votes. We may have uh, additional votes this afternoon and we will be adjourning and quickly trying to come back. Uh, and also apologize to our guests as well. It's a rather cramped quarters. This is our second hearing to examine management of public housing tenant initiative programs by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. On November 9th last year, we heard testimony about HUD's role in the National Tenant Organization's NTO August 1995 conference in Puerto Rico that raised many more questions than answers. As a result, we asked the Inspector General to investigate HUD's activity, active, visual, and taxpayer-funded support for a convention advertised as a vacation. Today, the Inspector General will provide her findings and recommendations. Ms. Gaffney and her staff have conducted a thorough examination of the facts and circumstances leading to the expenditure of over 300,000 federal tax dollars on the NTO conference. We appreciate the time, effort, and resources the Inspector General has devoted to this task and are grateful for all her work to improve the performance of HUD programs. The central question before us is this. Has the tenant initiative program been corrupted by mismanagement, lack o lax oversight, and political agendas? It's troubling to think that may be the case. I believe in tenant management. I want to say it again, I believe strongly in tenant management. It's essential to improve public housing and the lives of those who live there. When this subcommittee went to Chicago, I saw the hope of public housing in Cora Moore and the residents of 1230 North Burling who are sh shaping a better future for themselves amidst the bleak landscape of Caprini Green. Last November, Bertha Gerke of the National Tenants Union, NTU, literally and persuasively preached the message of tenant initiative and self-sufficiency to us. Because these programs are so important, even the appearance of abuse or waste is unacceptable. Training considered eligible for payment under the Tenant Opportunity Program called TOP must be substantive and thorough, and HUD must know it before authorizing the expenditure. HUD participation in private meetings and conferences must serve the public's interest, not the limited agenda of a sponsoring organization, and HUD must know that is the case before participating in a private event. HUD should verify the legitimacy and financial integrity of the organizations with which it forms ongoing relationships. When doing business with HUD, an organization that holds itself out as incorporated should be incorporated. And when the organization holds itself out as nonprofit, it should be a nonprofit and have the financial records to prove it. In our previous hearing, HUD witnesses and others testified that HUD and NTO met these tests. Today we will hear testimony leading to quite a different conclusion that is very troubling to us. Troubling not only because previous testimony before the subcommittee was inaccurate and incomplete, but because any failure by HUD to maintain the integrity of its procedures and decisions undermines the agency's efforts to empower tenants. In this instance, HUD determined that the NTO conference in Puerto Rico was legitimate tenant training based on uh, invalid assumptions about the sponsoring organization and the unsettling premise that the department routinely deems any such conference an eligible expense. That is not satisfactory. Some might ask why we bother with so small a program. After all, what's 15 or 20 million dollars in a 22 billion dollar HUD budget? But for those who use tenant initiatives as their path out of isolation and dependency, these programs mean a great deal. It is for them and the taxpayer we demand the highest standards of integrity and performance from the department and its private partners. The misuse of these funds for a paid vacation is a dagger in the heart of tenant empowerment efforts. 
and if not corrected, will result in the complete elimination of a vital program. The testimony of our witnesses today will help us determine the true scope of this program and what HUD is doing to fix it, and what HUD is doing to fix it. We appreciate their participation today. And at this time, I'd like to, uh, to invite uh, the ranking member of this committee, someone who has been uh, just tireless in his efforts to uh, serve this committee on a bipartisan basis, and that's the way this committee functions. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I welcome a careful, balanced, and candid review of these allegations. I share the concerns of the members of this committee. To understand the true nature of events, I appreciate all you have done, Mr. Chairman, to make this hearing a fair and open process. I also believe that we share a commitment to a resolution that strengthens HUD's ability to administer these unique and invaluable resident programs. But before we begin, I think it's useful that we put this in the appropriate context. After all, this is not about useless multi-billion dollar weapons systems. It is about trying to improve the quality of life for human beings. The $25 million Tenant Opportunities Program represents the only federal housing dollars specified for residents' use. This $25 million is one three hundredth of 1% of HUD's $7.5 billion budget. This is HUD's public housing money, which has been redirected to promote self-sufficiency for residents so that someday they won't need public housing. Failing to use these funds for this purpose does not save money. It just fails to invest it properly. We're in search of an explanation of $335,000, possibly misspent federal dollars, which has been alleged. The math on that is 175th of one three hundredths of one percent of HUD's 1995 budget. These funds have somehow taken on the significance of the national debt, perhaps because they pass through the hands of public housing residents. And then there's those that will say to you, well, they had the conference in Puerto Rico, which to my knowledge is still a part of the United States, and is home of the second largest public housing authority, has been viewed by some as too exotic for a public housing conference. In point of fact, Puerto Rico has been recognized for a number of innovative resident programs, including an economic development project which has employed over 500 public housing residents and established 60 resident-owned businesses and franchises. As a result of these kinds of initiatives, the Housing Authority in Puerto Rico was enthusiastic about hosting a resident training conference, and I think rightfully so. Still, I am deeply troubled by the apparent failure of current and former HUD staff to exercise the appropriate control that would have ensured that residents' initiative and training funds were properly used. I look forward to the candid testimony of all of today's witnesses and thank them for the time and assistance. I particularly wish to thank the Inspector General for her work and the work of her staff. The IG's views will lay the foundation for our evaluation of later testimony. It is therefore critical that clear distinctions are made between fact, conjecture, and theory. Finally, I would like to say I hope that in our review of these sensitive and difficult matters that we are careful not to send a signal that we doubt the ability and commitment of residents to manage their own lives and their own homes. 
At the same time, however, we must demand better performance measures and accountability to ensure that federal dollars are properly used and make certain that they are not misused. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. And I'm going to just um, caution the audience. This is a hearing. Uh, this is not a political event. This is a hearing. And I'm going to invite the audience to respect the fact that this is a hearing. I'll tolerate a few amens, but not many. Okay. Mr. Martini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for uh, continuing this hearing until uh, this afternoon. Um, as you're aware, Mr. Chairman, last summer my office received documents which suggested a highly questionable use of taxpayer dollars to fund the National Tenants Organization annual convention in San Juan, Puerto Rico. At that time, when this was brought to my attention, I felt it was my obligation to share these materials with this subcommittee so a full investigation and inquiry could be conducted. I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, and the subcommittee staff and Office of the Inspector General at HUD for their swift and thorough action on this matter. Last August, Gary Scher, a city councilman from the city of Passaic, notified my office that two residents of the Alfred Spear Village Resident Council had asked the Passaic Housing Authority for a loan of $2,860 so they could attend the National Tenant Organization's annual convention in Puerto Rico. The Housing Authority, to their credit, astutely denied this request, and I commend them for that decision. In fact, Councilman Scher was absolutely dismayed that HUD funds could be used for what the National Tenants Organization promoted as an unforgettable vacation for public housing residents across the country. With a public housing waiting list of over 4,000 residents, Council, Councilman Scher could not, nor could I, comprehend sending two sake residents to this type of a convention. I am very troubled by the egregious promotion of the NTO's August 20th convention. The event was billed as, and I quote, a vacation that will be unforgettable, and we referred to that considerably uh, at the last hearing in November. The flyer promoting this uh, convention, Mr. Chairman, reflected, uh, and I quote again, uh, that the convention would uh, promote uh, casinos for dads, exotic shopping, beauty salons for complete pampering for moms, and appetizing, savory, delicious foods for, the family, me for family meals. Uh, despite this, Mr. Moses, the HUD Deputy Assistant Secretary for Community Relations Involvement, in, in a June 17, 1995 letter stated, quote, the NTO convention is an allowable training activity for reimbursement under public housing funds, including but not limited to operating subsidy, comprehensive grant program, a top or other HUD funds. During the November uh, hearing, uh, in, in summary, as I recall, uh, there seemed to be considerable downplay with respect to this entire inquiry. And in fact, I think, but for the fact that the, uh, most of the witnesses seemed to indicate that perhaps the flyer had been inappropriately designed and distributed, uh, there were no other concerns or little concerns with respect to the actual event itself. The Inspector General's report to this subcommittee has unfortunately confirmed some of our worst suspicions about the NTO vacation slash conference. Even more uh, disturbing is the fact that at the last hearing, HUD officials offered what appeared to be some conflicting or contradictory uh, testimony to what now is revealed in the Inspector General's report. At the time in November, the HUD officials testifying uh, insisted that they did not play a significant role in the organization of the NTO, NTO Puerto Rican uh, Convention. Yet the Inspector General concluded, and these are quotes from her very report, quote, HUD officials played a significant role in planning and conducting the NTO conference. The role, the role went report appears inappropriate for a private profit-making activity with a strong emphasis on political lobbying, unquote. According to that same report, the cost of the NTO convention was over $335,000, 97% of which was paid by the American taxpayer. It is also clear that the NTO netted a profit of some $35,000 from this event. And even more troubling is that at the time, NTO's tax-exempt status was apparently revoked by the IRS. I wish this story could end there, but unfortunately, it only gets worse. According to the Inspector General, the chairwoman of the NTO was proposed for debarment by the HUD's Office of Housing in 1994 
based upon poor financial management practices in connection with managing a HUD assisted multifamily housing project. And that's again another disclosure by the Inspector General. They went on to quote, in settlement of this action, the NTO's chairwoman agreed to voluntarily exclusion from participating in HUD multifamily housing programs for a two year period beginning November 10th, 1994, unquote. Yet incredibly to me, despite this record, uh, uh, this known track record of financial mismanagement, the HUD officials still approved and actively supported the NTO convention. Mr. Chairman, when we talk about government that is out of control, uh, this is exactly the type of incident that stirs the American people's apprehension of what is going on in Washington, particularly the Washington bureaucracy. It is clear that at least three violations of HUD departmental policies did occur, according to the Inspector General who made inquiry into this matter. And to, in the interest of saving time, the Inspector General's report refers to those three violations. Let me just go ahead and say that having read those, and I'm sure reference will be made to those during the continuation of this hearing, it is my opinion that this is exactly the type of the waste, fraud, and abuse that disturbs the American people. I do not believe that the average American feels that their tax dollars should be funding a, quote, unforgettable vacation for public housing recipients or anyone for that matter. And it is very difficult for this member of Congress to comprehend how an event like this is an acceptable use of taxpayer funds. Somewhere along the way, we seem to have lost sight of the fact that public housing was designed to be helpful uh, economically to economically distressed people and to help them get through difficult periods of times in their lives. And I want to know what HUD officials are doing and the purpose of this inquiry is to ensure that this type of practice does not occur again. I would also like to know what disciplinary action uh, HUD intends to take against some of the uh, occurrences that uh, uh, happened with respect to this incident. Let me conclude my opening remarks by simply saying what began in November, Mr. Chairman, as a uh, inquiry into a flyer uh, in, 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 in large part and what appeared to be an inappropriate way of promoting what was told to us to be a legitimate use of HUD funds has now turned into something more considerable and more disturbing. What we've subsequently found out by the Inspector General's report is that uh, in many ways this event violated the very policies of HUD, that in fact the NTO was a for-profit uh, organization, that in fact HUD was instrumental in sponsoring and uh, setting up this very event, and that the event itself, while promoted as a convention under the top program, which was intended to assist tenants in managing uh, properties uh, and undertaking the administration of those prop uh, properties, has by the very Inspector General's uh, report uh, was, was really more of a social event as well as a political event, both of which are in violation of HUD regulations and policies. My deepest concern is that uh, there were policies and there were regulations, and yet the people who were entrusted to uh, enforce those and abide by those appear to have violated those policies. The policies were there, and yet the people that uh, we entrust to um, insist on uh, conducting the affairs of HUD in a responsible way appear to have disregarded those policies based upon, these are not my conclusions, but the conclusions of the uh, Inspector General. So what appeared to be on its surface a somewhat uh, insignificant matter to begin with and was downplayed considerably by the witnesses who appeared here in November, uh, the Inspector General's report indicates quite to the contrary, is a matter which if we're serious about promoting savings in this federal government, if we're serious about providing services in a cost-effective, efficient way and giving our taxpayer dollars uh, the most bang for their dollar, uh, this is certainly not the way to do it. And finally, let me conclude by the real losers in this situation are not just the American taxpayers, uh, but the people who are on these long waiting lists uh, for housing needs that we hear about repeatedly that we would like to serve and yet when we see this type of expenditure in such an inappropriate manner, it makes us have to go in and look at the viability of many of these programs, such as the top program and other programs where there may be waste. So I'm looking forward to continuing this hearing today, and I thank you for conducting it and having this uh, hearing continued. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Vitar. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's obvious that uh, much conclusion has already been reached um, before the hearing has begun. So. Rather than add into that, I will 
uh, just yield uh, my time. I want to thank you for your continuing effort to uh, focus in on important issues uh, uh, that this committee needs to look into. Thank the gentleman. And um, uh, I want to say before calling our first witness that um, it's my hope that this would be the last hearing. It was my hope that the last hearing would have been the last hearing. And um, uh, for anyone who has testified in the previous hearing, if they want to retract any statement they made under oath, I encourage them to do if they feel that statement was not accurate. Um, for me, this hearing will go on if we don't get the truth. If we get the truth and an answer to the problems, then we will be done with this hearing. And it is really up to our witnesses and up to HUD uh, to determine whether this hearing has a life of its own. And with that, um, I would like to also say before calling any witness, uh, I want to emphasize that all witnesses will be under oath. And it is likely that someone will get into more trouble by not telling the truth and to tell the truth however ugly that truth may be. And I really caution each witness that comes before us to simply tell us the truth. And the truth will be a lot easier for all of us. And that's my expectation that that will be the case. And uh, with that, I would uh, call um, the Inspector General of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Susan Gaffney. And if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I think it's important that you give your statement as you see fit. Uh, I'm not going to turn on a clock for five minutes, and uh, frankly, I'm not going to do it for any of the other witnesses. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members... And I'm going to ask you to speak nice and loud and bring that mic as close as possible to okay. you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, uh, you will remember that at your November 9th hearing, I promised that we, the Office of Inspector General, would look into the circumstances surrounding the National Tenant Organization's meeting in Puerto Rico that was held in August of 1995. We have indeed conducted uh, an extensive fact-finding inquiry into that meeting, and I am here today to relay the facts as we know them. And I have heard you, Mr. Towns. I am going to try to stick to the facts as we know them. There are three parts to my testimony. The first is to relay to you basic information about the meeting in Puerto Rico concerning its attendance, its costs, its funding, and its content. The second part of my testimony will deal with HUD's role in planning for, supporting, and conducting the conference in Puerto Rico. And the third part of my testimony will deal with HUD's overall relationship with the national tenant organization, which I am going to be referring to as NTO. First of all, basic information about the meeting in Puerto Rico. As a preface, I had anticipated that we would get the basic information uh, about this meeting by issuing a subpoena um, to the chairwoman of NTO. Uh, we issued such a subpoena. The response was highly untimely. And the information that we received as a result of the subpoena was fragmentary at its very best. As a result of that, we resorted to other means to obtain basic information. We issued subpoenas to the two hotels in Puerto Rico where the participants stayed. Based on their information, we, for instance, were able to identify the names of the individuals who participated in the conference. There were some 194 residents who attended the conference. In order to determine the costs that were incurred by them and by others, we interviewed 169 of those residents and went also to their housing authorities to confirm the information they gave us. We asked the residents a number of things. We asked them to identify the costs they had incurred, if they knew it, it, how those costs had been funded. We asked them their views of the conference. Was it useful? What was their assessment? Um, there were a total, in terms of attendance, 
There were a total of 260 persons who participated in this conference. 32 of them were speakers from NTO, the Puerto Rican Housing Authority, HUD. 34 were public housing officials. 194, as I said, were residents of public housing. We have estimated the costs of this conference at $335,000. And what that represents, we used the methodology I just described, getting the names of individuals, going to the individuals, and going to their housing authorities. There were some individuals we could not locate, some 20, 30, or 30. We have not projected costs for those people, so this, the number that I am giving you represents what I consider to be a minimum cost. The $335,000 represents hotels, meals, travel expenses, incidental expenses. It does not include, for instance, salary costs that of the HUD people who attended the, the conference. Now, the question of how that, that was a focus during the last hearing is how were these costs covered? What funding sources were used? Top grant funds provided $85,000. Other public housing funds, operating subsidy funds, modernization funds were used to the extent of 203000 now, I'd like to clarify something here. Some of these other funds, the modernization funds, uh, operating subsidy, were used as an advance. We had at this conference some new recipients of top grants. They didn't yet have the grants, and they also couldn't use the funding until they had been to HUD-sponsored training on top. Therefore, the arrangement for some of these people, and I do not know the extent of this, was other housing authority, of course, their HUD funds, were advanced to them on the premise that they would later be repaid when the top grant funds were available. However, I would like to go back to something that Mr. Martini said, and that is there was the Assistant Secretary for Community Relations and Involvement issued a June 27th memorandum in 1995 where he characterized this meeting as a training conference, and he specified that it was eligible for any kind of public housing funding, specified operating subsidy, modernization, top, or any other kind of funding. So to the extent that people thought this was a top funded, was intended as top funded, that is not the case based on this June 27th memorandum. I am continuing with my list of funding sources now. Um, HUD it paid f about $2,000 for handouts and, of course, incurred costs that were paid for travel for the HUD participants to the tune of about $5,600. NTO, from its own funds, contributed $3,200. There were a few private people who paid their own way to the conference, and that constituted about $5,800 in funding. The last source of funding was $32,000 in contributions from contractors who work for the Puerto Rican Housing Authority. The Puerto Rican Housing Authority, by way of explanation, is largely privatized. That is, the operations are conducted by con private contractors who work for the Housing Authority. There are 18 such contractors. It's important that you understand how it came to be that these contractors contributed $32,000 to this meeting. There was a meeting on June 26th at HUD among the executive director of the Puerto Rican Housing Authority, the assistant secretary for community relations and involvement, and the chairwoman of NTO. Uh, the first hour of that meeting was among those three people only. The second and third hours of that meeting, there were two resident leaders from Puerto Rico who were invited to join. Following that meeting, um, I should say preceding that meeting, there had been a request from the chair, a written request 
from the chairwoman of NTO to the assistant secretary at HUD saying she needed his assistance in getting attendance for this conference. Following the June 26th meeting, um, several things happened, but the most important one was that there was a, that there was a solicitation from the Puerto Rican Housing Authority, which is in writing, which is confirmed in writing, to the management agents, the private management agents, asking them to, to contribute $1,500 each toward the NTO conference. 17 of the 18 private agents made those contributions. They followed the directions from the Housing Authority and made those deposits directly into an account at the hotel. There is uh, no question in our, in my mind, based on our interviews of the executive director and three of these management agents, that this solicitation was by the housing authority to private contractors who were under contract to the housing authority, and the instruction was to the management agents that they should use their HUD-funded management fees to make these contributions. These funds, the bulk of these funds, were put in a, an account at the hotel and they were used for three luncheons, coffee, and a bar account. The next funding related issue is gratuities, which is something, Mr. Chairman, you asked about at the last hearing. There were two hotels involved here. They provided approximately $3,000 worth of free photocopying and mailing services to NTO. In addition, the El San Juan Hotel provided free a free planning luncheon and a suite for nine nights for the chairwoman of NTO. That suite, the going rate for that suite uh, was $850 a night. So these gratuities in, in total in excess of $12,000. Uh, the next financial area is, has to do with NTO proceeds from this meeting. NTO charged a res registration fee of $225 per person. <coughs> not everyone paid. Notably, the residents from Puerto Rico did not pay um, the registration fee as far as we know. Our estimate of the gross proceeds from these registration fees, and remember the methodology we used to get there, was interviewing individual residents and their housing authorities on what expenditures were incurred, was $46,000. In response to the subpoena that we issued to the chairwoman of NTO, there were a few checks that we obtained they were for flowers and plaques and that sort of thing. They totaled $3,207. That would mean that if the gross proceeds from the registration fees were $46,000 and the total NTO expenditures were $3,200, that NTO derived net proceeds from this meeting of approximately $43,000. I would say to you just recently, because the, the information that we got in response to our subpoena to the chairwoman was so fragmentary, we subsequently issued another subpoena to the bank where N NTO's uh, account is maintained. Uh, we've had some difficulty getting those records. Uh, we finally have them. Our review of the, the bank statements, the deposits that were made in August, the checks that were written in August leads us to believe that our original calculation of net proceeds of $43,000 is almost exactly on the mark. In terms of the content of the meeting, I think the most important thing that has happened is that we were able to obtain the videotape that was made of, with a few lapses of the entire session. I think that's so critically important because I don't want to be subjective either. 
I can look, I, I can have one view and you could have one view, but we have a videotape now that's available to all of us and we can all see what happened and there doesn't have to be a lot of ambiguity about it. I would say to you that, and, and this is going to sound object, uh, subjective, Mr. Towns, but my view about what has happened at this meeting is that there is an amalgam of two different kinds of things happening. One, this is, this, this started out as the biennial meeting, the biennial convention of NTO, which is called for in the NTO guidelines, by, bylaws. And many aspects of what happened in Puerto Rico are like a convention. Yes, there was political rallying. Yes, there was socializing. Yes, there was talking. It is in the nature of the kind of things that we think about being associated with the convention. There was another stream of things that happened, um, and it primarily related to the HUD participation in the conference, and that was a series of presentations by HUD officials, which were general programmatic presentations about NTO and resident initiatives and the future of public housing. The, the thing, it seems to me, in my view, that those two streams are separable. I, I don't, I, I think there are a couple of important things to mention, though. Um, and that is, as you know, if you have watched the videotape on the opening day, a HUD official, a HUD employee, was serving as translator from English to Spanish because a large number of the participants were from Puerto Rico. In the middle of a presentation by an NTO official, he ceased, stood up, said he would no longer translate because the message had become so highly political. The NTO official essentially responded that that was all right. He really didn't care whether I had translated it or not because the point was to get rid of Newt Gingrich. I think another issue that we really shouldn't lose sight of is that, that the early bird session on organi organizing techniques and coalition building was in fact a fundraiser conducted by NTO officials at which they solicited funds from public housing residents in the name of Jesus so that NTO could buy a computer. I think um, perhaps the most important thing you should know is how the residents reacted to the usefulness of the meeting. Um, and, I, and again, we interviewed 169 of them. I would say the majority of them thought it was personally rewarding. It is clear, though, that they felt it was poorly organized and it wasn't worth the money. That covers uh, the basic information that we have compiled on the meeting. The second area that I'd like to discuss is HUD's role in planning, supporting, and conducting the conference. As I think I mentioned before, there was a June 20th, 1995 letter from the NTO chairwoman to the assistant secretary for um, community relations and involvement. The letter says that the chairwoman is enclosing all of the convention material and is asking for the assistant secretary's assistance. And a little background here, when NTO started planning this meeting, they were hoping to have 1,000 rooms. It was to be a very major event. As time went on, they were projecting to have 500 rooms. As time went on, they were having trouble getting the kind of participation they wanted. So it makes sense that they were turning to people for help. As I said before, 
On June 26th, the chairwoman of NTO, the assistant secretary for HUD, and the executive director of the Puerto Rican Housing Authority met at HUD in Washington, D.C. The next day, the assistant secretary issued two memoranda. One was to the chairwoman of NTA, and this was the memorandum that said, this meeting is a training conference and is eligible for any kind of PHA funding. The second memorandum that was issued the day following the meeting was to the executive director of the Puerto Rican Housing Authority and to the chairwoman of NTO. And what this memorandum did was summarize the agreements that they had reached at their meeting the previous day. And essentially, the agreements they reached were that the Puerto Rican Housing Authority would co-sponsor this conference. Um, and there were a series of other agreements that the, the resident committee would be increased by 10 representatives from Puerto Rico, um, a series of things like that. So it is obvious that that June 26th meeting in which HUD participated was critical. On July 12, 1995, the Puerto Rican Housing Authority issued a press release. And it announced with great pride that they were going to be sponsoring, co-sponsoring this NTO meeting. And it cited the meeting on June 26th with the assistant secretary and the chairwoman as the vehicle for bringing this about. On the 28th of July, the Puerto Rican Housing Authority issued a letter to the NTO chairwoman. And what this letter said was, based on our meeting with the assistant secretary on June 26th, this is what we're willing to do. We are willing to put up $30,000 to cover registration fees for residents from public housing uh, in Puerto Rico who will attend this conference. And we will, in addition, put up $32,000 to be derived from private contributions. You will remember this is a $32,000 that, in the end, um, was contributed by the contractors for the Puerto Rican Housing Authority. HUD provided, HUD provided NTO with mailing lists and labels for the Housing Authority and the resident councils. HUD communicated with resident councils and public housing authorities to clarify that attendance at this meeting was eligible. And there were a fair number of questions raised. Um, the director, for instance, of the Detroit Housing Department was very concerned about the high costs involved. And she had conversations with HUD, w during which HUD simply, according to her, reiter reiterated this is an eligible cost. There we have copies of correspondence within HUD where HUD staff members questioned whether this was a wise expenditure of HUD funds. And the answer was that attendance at the NTO meeting in Puerto Rico was a priority. The next uh, fact is that in August, the NTO chairwoman issued. Just to interrupt you a second, yeah. just to get a sense of, uh, it, it, since you this has been thorough, I do want to make sure that all the facts are put on the table. I just want to get a sense of, of how much longer you think you need to go through to give this. I'm, I'm, I'm almost finished. OK. I want you to continue as you are. I just wanted to be able to gauge. Thank you. In August, the chairwoman of NTO issued mailgrams to Senator D'Amato, Andrew Brimmer, and Congressman Leach. They announced the meeting in Puerto Rico and contained the following statement. We in HUD invite and expect all communities in states and the District of Columbia to join us and HUD in San Juan. The Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing was CC'd on that message. And we have a copy of a fax from uh, the chairwoman to the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Community um, Relations and Involvement. In terms of HUD participation in the conference, um, the, in the initial invitation was to Secretary Cisneros. 
He was unable to attend. He asked the Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing to attend in his place. The Assistant Secretary was unable to attend, and so the Deputy Assistant Secretary, Ed Moses, attended instead and served as the keynote speaker. There were four other HUD officials who attended. The, deputy, the overall uh, Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary, the Deputy Director for Program Development, and two HUD staff from the Puerto Rican office. On the first day, the Deputy Assistant Secretary and the, these, these titles are terrible, and the, pro, the Director of Program Development essentially were the keynote speakers. That was a period of two hours. The next day, three HUD staff were f constituted five hours on the agenda. The third day, a HUD official had two hours on the agenda, so that out of four and a half days of this conference, about nine hours or one day, more than one day, consisted of presentations by HUD. I did, did one other thing, there's a final indication of this relationship between HUD and NTO um, about this meeting. The chairwoman of NTO had a problem because she had arranged with someone to videotape this conference. The videotape we have is a result of that arrangement. They, they, they got into a dispute as a result of that, the woman who did the videotape would not turn it over to the, the chairwoman. And the chairwoman wrote to her, essentially threatening action against her, and CC'd HUD's deputy assistant secretary on that correspondence. The third area I'd like to talk about is HUD's overall relationship with NTO and its chairwoman, Maxine Green. As Mr. Martini indicated before, Maxine Green was proposed for debarment by HUD as uh, a mortgagor and manager of a multifamily uh, pro project in HUD. In October 1994, the settlement was that she agreed and HUD agreed that she would take a voluntary exclusion from participation a two-year voluntary exclusion from participation in a HUD's multifamily program. When the debarment, w the reason for the proposed debarment and the reason for the voluntary settlement were two, that the project was in bad physical condition and two, she, three actually, she had failed to produce financial reports to HUD and she had failed to produce audited financial statements over a period of five years. When the debarment was being proposed, the Deputy Assistant Secretary wrote to HUD's Office of General Counsel and said, what does this mean for us? Can we continue to support and participate in NTO workshops, conferences? The General Counsel wrote back saying, there is no debarment. It's only been proposed. Everyone gets due process. But keep in mind, these are serious charges, so you might want to temper your participation. When the debarment, when the voluntary exclusion occurred, we find no evidence of similar written communication between the program and the Office of General Counsel. There is an indication in one of our interviews that one of the PIH staffers went to OGC and was told, no, 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 these are two entirely different things. One is Maxine Green and the individual. The other is NTO, so there is no relationship. That's the proposed debarment, the voluntary exclusion, is the first thing you should know. The second thing you should know is that when we started this inquiry, we tried to find out what the legal standing of NTO was. We went to uh, the chairwoman's attorney and asked, and we were told that NTO is a registered nonprofit corporation in the District of Columbia. We went to the IRS and asked them, and they said, that's true. NTO is a 501c4 tax-exempt corporation based in part on their having nonprofit status in the District of Columbia. We then went to the District of Columbia to ask them whether that was the case. And we were told that NTO's nonprofit status had been revoked in 1981 by the District of Columbia for failure to submit required financial records. 
You misspeak when you said 81. Did you mean 91? 81. We then, you know, registration as a nonprofit um, is, is essentially happens at a state level. The tax exemption is at a federal level, but there is a link between them. Uh, we talked to uh, NTO's lawyer about, we essentially threatened to issue another subpoena to find out whether registration had occurred in another state, in another jurisdiction other than the District of Columbia after 1981. And in December, I, mid to late December, uh, she told us that in fact, I think on December 12, 1995, uh, Maxine Green registered NTO as a nonprofit in the state of Florida. The third thing that you should know about HUD and its relationship with NTO is that, is that in June of 1993, HUD established an ad hoc advisory committee on resident initiatives, and NTO with Maxine Green as its representatives is one of those five one of the five organizations that comprises that ad hoc committee. So there are periodically um, meetings at which Maxine is able to uh, come to HUD and present her views and participate in brainstorming. The last item which uh, may be of interest to you is that it is clear to us that when you were holding your November 9th hearing, um, there was concern, and you had called Maxine Green as a witness. There was concern in HUD about what she was going to say and whether what she would say, at least programmatically, would be uh, correct. And based on the telephone records we have, it is clear that there were extensive conversations between HUD staff and Maxine Green immediately prior to and after that hearing. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my testimony. Thank you for your testimony before this committee, and at uh, this time the chair will recognize Mr. Towns to uh, start the questioning off. Right. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Could I interrupt first? I, I didn't uh, note the presence of Mr. Barrett, and I s apologize. You came in uh, early on and have been here for a while. And uh, we have the gentleman from Virginia as well. Right. Uh, Ms. Gaffney, um, First of all, let me thank you for your testimony. Um, and I'm happy that the chairman uh, made the decision to not to use the clock so you could really sort of lay out all this information. I think it's important. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, I'm very concerned that we are clear on what we know to be fact and what we assume. I want to dispense with point which you have testified to as fact that the Puerto Rican Housing Authority executive director improperly solicited, solicited money from private management companies under contract with the Housing Authority. How did you determine that he made these solicitations? There is um, a piece of correspondence um, from the Puerto Rican Housing Authority to the uh, they're called administrative managers who are those uh, management agents. And it summarizes a meeting that was held that included only two representatives from only two of the 18 management agents. And it clearly specifies that the decision was made that the Puerto Rican Housing Authority would be, was asking its management agents to make those contributions. We, as I said, we also interviewed three of the management agents who made the contributions, and we asked them, why did you do that? And they, their answer to us in all three cases was that they were told to do it, now, not, not by the executive director himself, but by his press assistant. You have that correspondence? Do you have that? Those are records of our interviews, sure. We, we didn't see that. I'm uh, sorry. You should, you should have. Did you? Did, how did you ascertain that the $32,000 uh, that you referred to by him in his July 28th letter were the same funds that were solicited from the private managers? I mean, how did you know that? Well, I, I guess you're right that I don't know there. But the, the, the concept, 
going back to the June meeting was $32,000 in private donations. Mr. Rodriguez, the executive director, told in his statement to us, said that he was originally thinking of private donations, for instance, from Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola or something like that. Uh, we found no record of such donations. The only contributions from private entities that we found were these $32,000 from the contractors. So right. I am making an assumption, perhaps I should not. But the yeah, but that would be an assumption. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think we'd have to say it's an assumption. Uh, how would you respond to Mr. Rodriguez's expected testimony that the $32,000 that you referred to in the letter was to have been raised from corporations not related to public housing, but was never raised? And that solicitations of the private managers was engineered by an administrative agent, not him. In, um, first of all, I think it's clear, I would agree with Mr. Rodriguez, that he told us also that his original intention was to go. Now, let, me, let me change, let me change, maybe I want to ask you an easier question. Okay. Uh, if the money that you referred to in Rodriguez's July letter was never obtained, uh, would that change your findings? No. Would not. Let me just say for the witness, it's important that besides a up or down head or a shake this way, yeah. the transcriber needs to oh, know. Sorry. So that's all right. Sorry. You Mr. can Towns, do both at the same time. Mr. Towns, yes. ask me the question again, would you, so that I'm sure I understand what you're getting at. Yeah, and I said, if the money that you referred to in Rodriguez's July letter was never obtained, would that change your findings? No. Uh, no. That's the question. No. Mr. Rodriguez, in his interview with us, told us that his original thought was to go to Pepsi-Cola or whatever, and that his recollection was perhaps one of the management agents came to him with the idea of soliciting the other management agents for contributions. But from the record, it is the Puerto Rican Housing Authority that actually did that. The violation that it seems to me occurred, federal grantees and subgrantees are not permitted to solicit contributions of any type from contractors working from them. That happened in this case. Well, I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, you indicated, but let me just, just go back to, you know, and I wanted to try to rush through this, Mr. Chairman. I know that, you know, yeah, we have a lot of... Me, I have the clock on, but the gentleman is going to be permitted to pursue his questions. So, okay. um, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, we may go in through the night, but... Uh, yeah, well, don't, I hope it's not I with think me. it's important, so <laughs> I, I, I... But let me just say that you indicated that, you know, uh, that the incorporation was lost in 1981. Revoked, yes. Revoked in 1981. Correct. But however, the IRS status was still active and good, according to the information that you received. Uh, let me explain what I know about Please that. Please do, yes. Because let me, let, me, let me just sort of lay it out here where I'm coming from so you can answer all of it as we go along. How would HUD know this? Uh, I mean, uh, no, we, no, uh, I don't think HUD. I, I think there is no process whatever in HUD uh, for determining the legal standing of the entities that HUD deals with. And this isn't limited to resident initiatives or public and Indian housing. I don't think there is any process. And for HUD to have found this out, they would have had to have gone through what we went through, which was not an easy process. Um, but can I answer your question about the IRS? Sure, now? you can. Mm -hmm. As I understand the system, and I surely am not an expert in the tax system, uh, uh, there are supposed to be a couple of internal controls. Ninety-nine percent of the organizations that are tax exempt under 501c3 of the tax code are registered nonprofit corporations. That tends to be an essential link. You get the tax exemption in part because you're a registered nonprofit. Right. Two things are supposed to happen to make sure that that non that tax exemption is legitimate. The first thing that's supposed to happen is if there's a revocation at the state level, there's notification to the IRS. It looks as though that didn't happen. It looks as though the District of Columbia either didn't notify the IRS or the IRS, I, I can't explain that. The second thing that's supposed to happen is that tax-exempt organizations are supposed to be 
submit an annual form to the IRS, a 990. Right. It would appear that that form was never submitted for NTO after 1981. So those were checks that would have, that would have forced the IRS to consider the continuation of the tax exempt status when the nonprofit registration had been revoked, and they seem not to have been in operation. Okay. Well, the reason I asked the question is, see, it seems to me that if you couldn't, you didn't know NTO wasn't a nonprofit, oh. then how can you hold HUD accountable for supposed violations of general counsel memorandum regarding for profits? I mean, I'm, that's the question I'm, I'm, I'm trying I to. I don't. I, I, you know, I, I want to say to you, I don't know what NTO is legally. I really don't. I, I don't. They are legally not a nonprofit. Whether they are legally tax exempt, I think, is open to question. I don't know if that leads us to say they are for profit. And perhaps we went too far in saying that. But, but there needs to be a legal standing. When we are dealing with entities and we're dealing with federal funds, we should know the nature of the entities that we are dealing with. Registration as a for profit corporation or nonprofit brings with it a lot of assurances about how monies are spent. The primary assurance that registration as a nonprofit brings is that, that the net proceeds will be used only for specified purposes and that there will be no personal gain as a result of, of the organization's functioning. Those are important assurances that you would want to have as an individual. So should, I would think, HUD want to have as an organization. I understand that, you know, I, and I want to, don't want to label the point because I want to go to a couple other things, but I think that it's important for the record to reflect that there is some information here, I mean, that just is not readily meets the eye. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's the point I want to make. Abs you're absolutely and, correct. And, and the other thing is that um, should HUD undertake the reforms that you uh, advise, would you still be in favor of terminating the program as you recommended in your February 1995 report? Would you still recommend in, that we end the program? How vi viable will res how viable will residence management initiatives be without federal support? I mean, how you I feel would they, would they be able to function without I, that support? I, I I don't remember testifying that we should end uh, resident initiatives, resident management. I may have said that there is no need for a separate program. But I think Kevin Marchman has come up with a I good interpret idea. that to mean that. That, that, didn't, that didn't mean that? There's no need for a separate program, you're saying? Uh, that I, didn't I, don't mean remember, that I don't remember saying that. Is that what I said? I yes. can't imagine that I said resident management wasn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. I may have said that there isn't There's a no need, need for a separate program. A separate program. Right. But what I really remember saying is HUD shouldn't be running this program itself. If we're going to have this program, it should be run by the housing authorities. And I remember distinctly saying that there's a reason for that. We're not equipped to run programs like this. That's not, we're regulators, we're overseers. And I was very pleased to see in Mr. Marchman's statement that he is recommending to you a legislative change that would allow this program to remain separate but to be administered by the housing authorities. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You've been very generous, and I appreciate your generosity. Well, we're trying and to when get. When I become chairman, I'll remember this. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be long. <laughs> Probably in the back of my mind, I think that's true. <laughs> in ten years, when he becomes chairman, <laughs> at this time, I'd uh, I'd recognize uh, Mr. Martini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Ms. Gaffney, for your. Uh, investigation, your conclusions, and your testimony, and uh, I compliment you on doing a very thorough job uh, with this matter. Uh, to follow up on uh, Mr. Townsend's uh, line of questioning just a moment ago, um, with respect to determining the status, legal status of an entity, um, and I've had some experience uh, in terms of determining the legal status of so-called nonprofits before I uh, came to Washington. And uh, my experience was it's very, very simple. Uh, for instance, if someone is requesting a grant from a private foundation, let's say, it's very simple to ask for your 
for a 501c3 or your 501c4 status letter. And without that, you don't get the grant. Um, so I don't understand where Mr. Towns, from, from my, my colleague, is saying it doesn't readily meet your eye. It would seem to me that that was a procedure HUD should have had in place, and probably, it, I, I assume, the policies and regulations of HUD probably do indicate uh, something somewhere that uh, to confirm the status of an, uh, of an entity, all you'd have to do is make a request for their legal status before you would authorize granting monies. And um, so, so you're shaking your head. Yes, I think you understand that process is a very simple one. Am I correct? I think that's correct. I think that y from from the exp what I have learned in this instance, you would have to, you would want two things. You would want not only the tax exempt identifier, but you would want the nonprofit uh, identifier too. Well, from my personal experience in this, I mean, I have seen entities as small as the local Boys and Girls Club. Uh, who are seeking grants from a private uh, foundation, let's say, uh, and the uh, requirement being submit your, uh, as you said, your uh, mm -hmm. tax status and your legal status, right. and within an hour, right. uh, those materials are usually provided if they're seeking to have funding. And uh, it's a very simple process. So the sense, the suggestion a moment ago that this is some mysterious, difficult uh, uh, matter to accomplish is mind-boggling to me because I've done it every day for five years before I got to Washington mm. and I had this the smallest of nonprofits be able to provide that forthwith and uh, I think your experience uh, probably uh, or your knowledge of this now would, would suggest that that's in fact true let me let me um, try to summarize some of the matters of issue here that you've touched on um, you've also indicated that there was little or no your conclusions uh, are that there was little or no technical or training information at the uh, alleged convention, uh, and I believe that was the testimony you offered us a few moments ago. Is that correct? That there was little or no technical or training information provided at the convention itself. I, that's correct. And I th I'm not trying to. I'm just. And you also referred to it as it was largely social and uh, um, uh, po and political. An internal NTO business. Okay. And there, there's also no mystery to that either. These are not uh, the, I think, significant thing about your testimony is that uh, you came to that conclusion based on largely this video as well as interviews with many of the attendees there. Correct. All right. So I think we ought to try to dispute the suggestion that these are just your opinions. Uh, but rather, I think, in, unlike many instances where you don't have the benefit of a video confirmation, we have here a video confirmation uh, supporting what your conclusions are, correct? That is correct. The one, the one thing I would say to you there is on the second day of the conference, for instance, there was, there were five hours of presentations by HUD officials. Um, it, this is subjective judgment on our part that those weren't training courses as such. They were general presentations about the top program and of this. It is conceivable that someone else could look at those same sessions and label them training. With, with regard to NTO, you indicated several things that even uh, in, in response to your uh, request for information, uh, there was little cooperation and you were required to issue a subpoena. Is that correct? That's correct. And that even in response to the subpoena, the respo their response was untimely and lacking even after they were served with a subpoena, correct? That is certainly correct. Are you, uh, do you have in your possession any uh, of the financial records of NTO? In my, we have uh, issued a subpoena to the, uh, the bank um, where NTO maintains its account, and we have had full compliance from the bank now. But not from the NTO? Uh, we have been told that NTO simply doesn't have the records. Right. For instance, they gave us um, summary bank statements, the monthly kind of bank statements, and said they did not have the canceled checks that went with those statements. They simply mm -hmm. didn't have them. Have you ever received from NTO anything other than the November uh, convention, or the August, I'm sorry, August 1995 convention minutes, which we have the benefit of in our packet here, have you ever received from them any other minutes of, uh, of uh, 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 whatever this is, whether this is a corporation or a, uh, whatever status it is, have you ever received any other minutes of organizational meetings? You know, I don't know. We do have some minutes of organizational meetings. I just can't tell you whether we got them in, from NTO or elsewhere. Okay. Do you want me to? 
I can check. Does anyone know? Well, uh, no, we did not get them from NTO. We got them elsewhere. All right. Um, to this day, as you're sitting here and testifying, you still do not know what the legal status is of NTO, correct? No, I do not. All right. Uh, is it my, uh, am I correct in understanding that uh, under HUD policies, uh, they would not normally be providing grant funds to a profit, for-profit organization, is that correct? Or on what can, under what conditions would they? This kind of a workshop, I, I think, I, I, Mr. Martina, I, it is clear to me that HUD has a relationship with NTO that is based on, on HUD's believing that NTO was nonprofit. It is further clear to me, if, if this is answering your question, that had HUD understood NTO to be for profit, HUD would not have had this relationship. Because, for instance, NTO is a policy advisor. They're on this ad hoc advisory group. Y you wouldn't, I think you would be very leery about bringing a profit, for profit organization into that guise to, to give you guidance about your policy. I, I understand that, and I, and I concur with uh, your assessment of it. Is there anything, uh, apparently there's nothing uh, in the records of HUD that would indicate uh, uh, they're making inquiry as to the status of NTO? Uh, when no. was the last time, or is there any no. record in HUD uh, establishing uh, uh, somewhere in time in the past uh, that they had made an inquiry of what NTO's legal status was? No, sir, there is not, but I would say to you my impression is that that is not limited to NTO. I, my, I have seen no evidence that HUD in any rigorous way is asking the organizations we are dealing with to identify their legal standing. Uh, <laughs> this is disclosing something that is even more troubling to me because of my prior experience in this, in this field how simple it is to make inquiries of the status of the entity that you're s doing business with, whether it's in the private sector or whether it's in the nonprofit sector, uh, how simple it is, especially HUD is in a position often of issuing grants and fundings f to these organizations, and you've now indicated uh, with a very enlightening fact that there doesn't appear to be a practice or a procedure within HUD to make that very simple determination on a consistent uh, regular basis as part of its overall administrative process. Is that correct? You're shaking your head yes. Yes, I think that's correct. I, you know, uh, in the process of doing this inquiry, uh, we found memoranda that had been issued by the general counsel and HUD dealing with this distinction between profit, for-profit organizations and non-profit organizations. But I think what you find is that no one has a clear understanding, or at least the people we've been talking to, don't have a clear understanding of what that means legally, what, what that standing is. You know, they're just words that are used. <laughs> I appreciate your, 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 your forthrightness in this area, but, but uh, they are words, but they're pretty clearly defined in yes. the IRS code, and they're pretty clearly defined in state statutes. Um, and any, any practicing lawyer can pretty much determine what are the status of entities based on these uh, criteria. So um, if nothing else, and I think considerably more has come out from this hearing, I would certainly urge, and uh, it was one of your recommendations, that this policy be implemented forthwith. It's mind-boggling to me uh, hearing this that this was not an isolated incident, that apparently this is a... Uh, a practice of omission that's uh, apparently been uh, been done by HUD for many years now, and I could see this having led to and will lead to revelations uh, of considerable other misuses and abuses in this process uh, down the road that may have happened already or may still be occurring. The gentleman, would, I'd like to just get one more question in. Uh, sure. Question in, Mr. Fatah has. Uh, Thank you, you very much. You have uh, as much time as you want until the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have I, 10 minutes. I, Let me just say for the record, we have about nine and a half minutes until the vote is, right. is on. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you indicated that after these uh, interviews you had that essentially, I think your, your verbatim comment was that th the collective uh, consensus was that it was poorly organized and not worth the money. Uh, that is uh, a comment we hear a lot about the Congress. Huh? 
And I'm just trying to understand. I'm trying to understand, given the nature of conferences and training sessions and the like, um, you know, whether there's some subjective uh, uh, criteria that's really being used here. Now, for instance, you talked about when you answered uh, the uh, gentleman, uh, Mr. Martini's question, you said, well, there wasn't a great, he phrased it for you. He said, well, was, there was little or nothing in terms of training provided. When you originally testified, you said a few minutes ago that there was nine hours or so. Now, I'm trying to understand, because, you know, if you go to an ABA convention, the American Bar Association, the lawyers, they come, they take a few training programs while they're there, they write it off on their taxes, saying that they flew to West Palm Beach or somewhere for training, and they've really been playing golf for most of the day. Now, I'm trying to understand was there nine hours of training of some sort that was being provided, or was there nothing that redeemed this effort uh, in your eyes? In my eyes, and again, this is, this is going to have to be subjective, there were, uh, on the second and third day of the conference, a total of the people who did anything like training were the HUD officials who were there. Okay. And they did nine hours' worth? They did nine hours worth of program presentations okay. All right. that you could yeah. call training. All right, I'm just trying, because I, I, I heard the questioning, and I just want to make sure we keep the record clear that there was some training, or what could be called training. I wouldn't call place. it training, but you know, you could. Well, you, we got to start from where we are, too. Now, from what I know about working with uh, the whole effort of resident initiatives is to try to take public housing tenants and to familiarize them with regulations and rules and laws that most of us can't even understand half the time. And it takes a little while to take people and to bring them along to that. You have to start where they happen to be, and you have to work towards that effort. And so for people to assume that um, basic understandings of programs is, is not a beginning process of training, I mean, I have some problems. Let me move on, though. You said the IRS determined that this organization is tax exempt? Yeah, in 1972. Okay, and they have not since revoked that? No. Okay, to, to this day, have they revoked that? No, sir. Then let us be clear then that they, the IRS is the taxing authority in this country. They determine what organizations are tax exempt. And any suggestion that there's something other than what the IRS says flies in the face of that determination. Now, if they have failed to deal with their state registration, and have since corrected that that is not a unique occurrence in the world of nonprofits uh, from time to time. So the, the point I would make is that the IRS makes those determinations and that in every single instance where the government wants to determine whether you're tax exempt, they ask for the certification letter from the IRS. That is the document that is provided with every one of these proposals. But the point I, want, I really want to get to here is that I think we have to be careful that we don't hold this effort up to standards that we don't hold other efforts up to. That is, first of all, we talk about the location in Puerto Rico. There are plenty of government-sponsored meetings that take place in Puerto Rico. Secondly, uh, as I would understand my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they think it's perfectly fine if for-profit organizations or nonprofits do business with the government. So I don't know why we got off in that anyway, because I'm not sure if there was a for-profit that wanted to provide training to help public housing tenants, I would think that we'd all be for it to the degree that, uh, the that they could do it. We just uh, yield a sec. The question is, there are different procedures if they're for profit okay. or, or that's, that's the issue. But we're not chicken at for profits. No, though. absolutely okay. not. All right. But anyway, but that the, the point is, is that in many, many conferences that we go to uh, and that other professionals go to, uh, people play tennis, they play golf, they do all kinds of things in between meetings that take place. And they use it as an opportunity uh, to socialize and to, and to do this. So I'm trying to understand why are we treating public housing tenants, in this case, different, and, and why aren't we looking at all of the conventions that HUD is paid for or that other federal agencies are paid for, and, not, and why this particular uh, uh, occasion? We looked at this particular occasion for only one reason, and that is that we were asked by this committee to do so. Okay, let me ask you one last question. Is there anything that you found that you have uh, t that you believe and therefore have acted on by sending to the Justice Department any criminal activity by anyone involved in this? Anything other than bad judgment? Yes, sir. 
We have consulted with the United States Attorney's Office, and we are proceeding in one matter on his advice. He is the attorney. Is the, the Justice Department is proceeding? No, we are, are we are proceeding uh, in accordance with advice from the United States Attorney in one matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have about four minutes to vote. We're going to be at recess, and we'll be back as quickly as we can. We're ready if you're ready. Can't can't hold a hearing without the witness. <laughs> uh, Ms. Gaffney, I'm going to start the questioning before I yield to uh, Mr. Barrett. Um, did HUD officials make plans to contact witnesses before a subcommittee hearing on November 9, 1995? I'm sorry, could, could you say that again? Okay. I missed. Do you know if HUD officials made plans to contact witnesses before a subcommittee hearing on November 9, 1995? HUD, um, at least one HUD staffer was in touch with the chairwoman of NTO prior to the hearing. Do you have any evidence that HUD uh, would, did provide input to the congressional testimony of the NTO chairwoman? and another tenant group official prior to the subcommittee's November 9th hearing? Uh, we have um, the staffer's statement that she was, she did have discussions with Maxine Green and it was for the purpose of making sure that the programmatic information in Maxine Green's testimony was accurate. Okay. Um, The, in accordance with HUD policy on department participation in non-governmental conventions, who at HUD was responsible for determining that the NTO convention held in Puerto Rico in August of 1995 was in the best interest of the department? You know who would, would, the, would have been the responsible official at HUD? That would have I would assume that that would happen at the... Uh, well, it, actually, that determination can be made either at the assistant secretary level or the deputy assistant secretary level. Do we know where it was made in this case? Did anybody Obviously, step up and said I was the person? I haven't heard that, no. I haven't heard. Uh, certainly Mr. Uh, Moses, because he attended, must have in some way decided it was in the best interest of the government. Okay. So in terms of who at HUD authorized HUD's participation in the... August 1995 NTO convention. Clearly, Mr. Moses. Well, let me let me start with you know as I said, it was the Secretary Cisneros who was originally invited. Um, my understanding is he could not attend, and he asked Joe Schuldiner, the Assistant Secretary, to attend for him. Then it turned out he couldn't go, and that's how Mr. Moses ended up going. So, in a sense, it started with the Secretary. Did. HUD follow proper procedure in authorizing the department's participation in the August 95 NTO convention? It seems to me that the, the degree of HUD involvement in um, promoting this conference is not typical, is not usual. Not usual mean is probably did not follow the proper procedure? Correct. Uh, was the NTO convention held in Puerto Rico in August of 1995 the only event at which public housing residents could receive the information provided by HUD and NTO at that conference? No, that's an important point, and I wanted to, I should have told Mr. Fatah that. Um, the way the top program works, for instance, is that you cannot draw down the funds until you have received uh, training. Um, and HUD sponsors training programs for that purpose. And in fact, there was training scheduled, as I remember, in November and December of 1995, an actual resident initiative training session sponsored by HUD. Okay. okay. I think that's all the questions that I have. But this, Mr. Marquis, I would you have a yield to you. I have Thank a couple you, gentlemen, for yielding. And um, uh, just a couple more questions, uh, if I may. Um, you mentioned, uh, Ms. Gaffney, a moment ago that you looked at this incident because this committee had asked you to. Correct. As a result of that uh, request by this committee, 
uh, am I correct in saying you've, uh, you've uh, well, I guess your inquiry has revealed a number of practices which would need to be improved? Yes. And, and I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but just uh, was handed to me a moment ago, there has been a news release issued by uh, Secretary Henry uh, Cisneros uh, no. basically complimenting you. Uh, in light of your findings, uh, HUD has developed stricter guidance on HUD participation in conferences in which department funds and programs are significantly involved. Uh, he goes on to state further, we have taken steps to crack down on improper meal reimbursements, which is an issue that you did not touch upon in your testimony, but is in your report. Uh, we have informed the Puerto Rico Public Housing Administration that its solicitation of sponsorship funds may have violated HUD regulations. And most importantly, we are seriously weighing the Inspector General's recommendation that we sever all ties with the National Tenant Organization. Uh, so I'm pleased to see this uh, statement by the Secretary, it. and it compliments you and the fine work you've done in making this inquiry. And I think those who still want to insist, even in, in, this, uh, in this committee today, in, in making light of this, I'm pleased to see at least the Secretary un un uh, understands that this committee's inquiry has revealed what uh, now is pretty obvious, some serious flaws in a number of the practices in HUD in this area that need to be addressed and that uh, hopefully now will be addressed, not just in this one incident because we asked you to do it in, but in a multitude of incidents yes. where uh, HUD funds are going out to organizations that maybe heretofore nobody even knew what the status of them were and who we were dealing with. As I think is pretty apparent here, um, twofold, and then I, I'll wrap up my line of questioning for this moment. It's pretty apparent here that uh, one, uh, no efforts were taken to establish who is NTO in many, many years. And two, even in the face of a debarment proceeding and a voluntary suspension by NTO, someone in HUD felt it appropriate to still expend monies and to have a relationship with NTO, even in the very time frame within which HUD and NTO had agreed that they would not really have relations in terms of uh, interactions with this organization. So uh, there are many troubling areas here, but the good news is uh, our efforts have at least initiated some serious, uh, hopefully, reforms so that this will not uh, continue to occur. Uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time at this point. If, uh, we, we have a lot of witnesses, and we're going to be going on pretty long. And it's uh, now, Mr. Uh, Barrett, you do have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your holding a second hearing on this issue. The, the first time that this whole issue was really brought to my attention was at the first hearing when we saw the flyer that talked about the vacation type setting for this conference and any taxpayer, any citizen who saw that I think would have been offended by that. And I compliment the Secretary on responding to that and I compliment you. Uh, I saw that Mr. Cisneros is released today and clearly he feels that you've done a good job. So I appreciate the work that you have done, not only for the department but for this committee as, as well. I'd like to explore a little deeper the whole issue of the nonprofit status. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the reason that that's significant is because funds were going from HUD to the NTO. Is that, is that that's correct? That's correct. As I was looking through your written testimony, it appeared that in April of 1994, HUD's OGC, I assume that's Office of General Counsel, advised PIH that there was no legal basis requiring the discontinuance of their relations with NTO pending the final determination of the debar debarment case. Correct. I infer from that, that that PIH had contacted the Office of General Counsel asking for their guidance. Is that correct? The Deputy Assistant Secretary made a written request. In connection with this conference or just in general? NTO workshops, conferences, meetings in general, whether because of the proposed debarment, um, the Office of Public and Indian Housing should limit its support attendance, participation in those meetings and conferences and workshops. As I looked at your testimony, again, I think you've done an excellent job, the, the phrase that, that you use from the general counsel's uh, correspondence was, quote, that department participation in the NTO workshops be tempered by this consideration, end quote. I went to law school. That looks like a, a lawyer statement if I ever saw well, one. it was a lawyer. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, it was sort of on the one hand. On the other hand, and, and I didn't infer from that statement that, 
that any relationship with NTO should be terminated. Is there more there that's not in your written testimony that made it clear that no that not at all that essentially that as I and I am not a lawyer but as I read that response what oh, the response was saying after all there is something called due process mm -hmm. and you're you know at this point it's only been a proposed debarment there's still a process to go through but the charges are serious so you might want to temper your involvement. What I would have anticipated is once there was either a debarment or a voluntary exclusion that there would be, would have been other guidance based on the acts having taken place. Okay, and I, and I think that there is plenty here to be critical of and I'm just, I'm trying to figure out where we should be the most critical, oh. frankly. <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I question here though whether if I'm someone who works for public housing and, and I am not an attorney right. and someone tells me to temper temper my consideration, it tells me nothing. Exactly. I agree with you. And they didn't. I mean, it led them to no uh, action. Mm -hmm. Who do you think had the onus then once the debarment took place to take the next step? Was it public housing or what? should the general counsel's office have, have contacted them as a follow-up? What do you think would have been appropriate in this situation? It seems to me that the most fail-safe system would have been that the Office of General Counsel would have been tracking as they do track those cases and would notify their client, in this case, public and Indian housing. HUD is a very compartmentalized agency and this action was being brought by the Office of Housing. There is no reasonable assurance that actions by the Department of Housing would be made known to the Office of Public and Indian Housing. Mm -hmm. Your recommendation that, that the NTO, NTO let me rephrase that. What, what is your recommendation with, with NTO in general? At this point, At this that point. HUD suspend, cease any dealings, uh, participation with uh, financial support of NTO until HUD figures out what their legal standing is. Okay. If, if NTO filed the necessary documents with the state that it's incorporated in and with the IRS, what would be your recommendation at that point? I think uh, were I the Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing, I would say to myself, this is an organization that has existed for 27 years. In a whole series of fronts, it is clear that this organization lacks organization, lacks management, lacks the basic kind of skills that we expect in entities we deal with, and I would reevaluate my dealings with them, even if they were legally established. Okay. Let me ask the follow-up question, because I think from your earlier statements that you think that there is a role for a management tenant organization. And Surely. Maybe how, how do you think we should then proceed after this debacle to, to achieve that goal? Assuming that the, that the Department of HUD would follow your recommendation and cease dealings with it. How then do we create a tenants organization or, or what would you recommend then? I think the first step is there are a group of NTOs only one of various tenant organizations. I think the first thing HUD should do is sit back and take a long hard look at each one of them and decide which are really viable legal entities that are capable of producing substantive results. In the course of your investigation, did, did HUD try to cover up its involvement with the NTO at all? Did you see any evidence of that? Um, Mr. Moses has a view of his relationship with NTO, which is at odds with our view based on the record. Um, in interviews with other PIH staff, uh, particularly one staffer, the testimony changed significantly over time, even when it was sworn statements. Okay, and, and finally, of this whole investigation, what, what offended you most, I guess, is, is, is the bottom line question that I have for you. What offends me most is that something as important, you know, as important as resident management appears to me to be used <coughs> as uh, I don't even know how to describe it, a scam. That's what offends me. 
I think there are a number, and, and I'm really, I apologize to Mr. Towns because you're asking for my personal views. That's what I'm asking for. I think there are a number of parties who have participated in this scam over a period of years who have known that a lot of what's happened has not been substantive, and it's been kind of a, an insider's uh, kind of secret that we just put up with. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, you're, you've been testifying longer than we expected, but um, uh, it's very important that you testify. I haven't yet uh, asked questions. And I do want to say something. This is, um, uh, we have four separate people testifying. Uh, and uh, I do want to make sure the members uh, ask those questions first. I, I, you're not a member of this subcommittee, correct? No, but I was recognized after, before you came. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask my questions. Um, there are a few points that I wanted to, to be very clear about. Is it illegal for any housing authority to, to solicit funds from people who um, uh, do business with the housing authority? Yes. Uh, it is Contractor, yes. It mm -hmm. is illegal to yes. do that. So if in, fact, if, in fact, this was happening, uh, they would have committed an illegal act. Illegal, I'm sorry. Um, Against the it, rules and regulations? Regulation. Regulation. The regulations yes. of housing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Violates a regulation. Um, is it your. Sorry, yes. Can we clarify that? Would, sure. would that mean a, a criminal act or would that mean a, a, depart, a violation it's a, of the It's an administrative regulation. violation. It's okay. an, not, not a criminal act. That's correct. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Excuse I think it's me. a very important clarification. So it would be against the rules and regulations of HUD for a housing authority to solicit funds. Correct. Uh, now, what is the testimony that you have that would substantiate or, or give indication that the housing authority in Puerto Rico was soliciting funds from contractors? There is a memorandum from the executive director of the, the housing authority in Puerto Rico which summarizes a meeting at which this was discussed and it includes a determination that was made to solicit contributions from the management agents. And the memorandum was sent to the management agents. Okay. Now, is it your testimony that money, in fact, was raised by contractors? We have the checks from the individual contractors that were made out to the hotel. We have copies of the checks. Okay, and the checks were made out to the hotel. Correct, and that was the instruction from the Puerto Rican Housing Authority. Okay, now how do you know it was the instruction from the, the Puerto Rican Housing Authority? Hmm. I, don't, I can't remember the answer to that. Okay, well, let me ask you this. You did say that you were told by, uh, this is an important question that we need to, to, to establish. Uh, when I was here earlier, I thought you said that the press secretary had substantiated that they had solicited funds. The, what I said before is we interviewed three of the management agents, and we asked them, why did you write these checks to the El San Juan Hotel? And they said, because we were instructed to do so, and the vehicle, the conduit for conveying that message was the press assistant to the executive director of the Public Housing Authority in Puerto Rico. Okay. And it's your testimony that how much money was, in fact, raised? $32,000. Okay. So there was $32,000 raised from contractors solicited by uh, the housing authority. Correct. Okay. Is it your testimony that NTO was given $225 per uh, participant or per housing authority? No. Participant at the conference. Okay. It was a registration fee. That was fee the registration per fee. Per person. Okay. And that total registration fee amounted to what? According Approximately $46,000 based on the work that we did. Uh, how many subpoenas have you had with uh, NTO? I think actually there's been only one. Okay. Correct. And it's your testimony that because they were not cooperative, you were forced to get information from uh, the tenants who have participated in this program themselves? I mean, what is your testimony as it relates to the cooperation of NTO? Um, um, Two things. One, NTO was very untimely in responding to the subpoena. It was a matter of a couple of months 
before they got back to us. When they got back to us, it was with what I have called fragmentary information. Now, I don't know what that means. If we assume that they, in good faith, were trying to respond to the subpoena and they have only fragmentary inf information, that means a lack of record keeping, a lack of records. Um, what the attorney said is, she, is that the, the chairman, chairwoman simply didn't have anything else. What kind of information did you request that NTO provide? For instance, the names of the people who were attending the conference. Is that somehow privileged information? No, no, no. And they did not allege. At one point, we had asked that uh, NTO identify their membership to us. And they, their response was that was beyond our purview in this inquiry. And we agreed with that and asked them <laughs> only for the, the, the people who attended. And they we, did not give you the names of the people no, who attended? No. We asked for the financial records. NTOs associated with the conference. And that they is, did not give you the information. No, financial eventually, record. after some period of time, what they gave us were three monthly bank statements uh, for the NTO account. There were no canceled checks supporting them. We were therefore not able to use the information because it's impossible to know. You understand what I'm saying? Now, this was advertised as a. Um, as the National Tenants Organization's 1990 convention, 1995 convention, August 20th, 19, uh, 20th to the 24th. So it was advertised as the National Tenant Organization's 1995 convention. Is that what it was? Correct. OK. Relate to me uh, the fact that there would be a convention of either a nonprofit organization or a private business, and relate to me uh, the connection between the use of, of money from HUD that is for training and development. Is it the responsibility of HUD to pay people to go to a annual convention of an organization? I think the answer to that is absolutely not. The money is set aside for what? I think the reason that instead of calling this, HUD called this a training conference instead of the biennial convention was because how you could use the federal funds appropriately would be for training. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of other witnesses. I, we have two members who are, are not members of this subcommittee. Would either of them like to uh, ask questions? Yes, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to be. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you say Miss Collins? Yeah, I did. Excuse me, please. My hearing has become impaired because of many years of service in the House of Representatives. <laughs> <laughs> I let, me, let me just say, for the record, we are going to be going through uh, this hearing uh, and conducting a thorough investigation. And members who are members of the full committee are by invitation uh, welcome to participate today, but uh, it's at our invitation. Uh, it would be appreciated in the future that the, 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 the decision to participate would first be made to the chairman before, <coughs> before participating. Um, I, I haven't had any dialogue between it. We're just trying to gauge the amount of time it's going to take to conduct this hearing. Ms. Collins, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me and allowing me to participate in the subcommittee hearing. Before you came in, uh, Chairman Davis had put my name on the list to speak, and I guess he just failed to uh, communicate that to you. Uh, Ms. Gaffney, you said that there are other organizations besides NTO. Could you name a couple of them? Uh, yes. Uh, Ab I'm going to help me with the, uh, Phil, the full name of uh, the National uh, Tenant Union is one. Uh, NASCAM, what is, what does National that Tenant Na National Tenant Education Association. National Association of Resident Management Associations. And they're all active as the National Tenants Organization is? Yes. It seems to me that um, you have a lot of concern about NTO. And I just wonder, when you have um, a community, a grassroots organization that is so 
much involved in the community activities of public housing that instead of discontinuing relationships that you would seek to educate them or help them tighten up their um, organizing abilities. Has had ever thought of that? Or have you ever thought of recommending that? I, uh, I think what's happened is that HUD has had long-standing relationships with these organizations and that HUD, I am not aware of HUD's trying to get the organizations to tighten up uh, their procedures. I think it's just been business as usual over quite a long period of time. Has HUD instituted any internal controls in response to this inquiry? I am told uh, that the secretary issued a press release today saying that he was doing so. I wasn't aware of that before the hearing. That he was going to start doing that. Are those other um, organizations as active as NTO? Yes, there are a number. There are particularly five. And as organized throughout the country? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then why does HUD have one relationship? HUD doesn't have just one relationship. For instance, we have a HUD has an ad hoc advisory committee that, that consists of uh, nonprofit organizations to advise on resident initiatives. There are five organizations on that ad hoc committee. NTO is only one. Mm -hmm. What do you think of my suggestion that HUD attempt to um, give professional help to the educating and organizing of NTO I, I to function in the way they should function? I think you're absolutely right. I don't think you throw necessarily the baby out with the bathwater. I think the first thing HUD should do is stand back, look at all these organizations, find out what their legal status is, make sure their finances are in shape and we know who we're dealing with. Assuming we're dealing with good entities, then tighten up, establish the rules, say this is what this is what how we want it done, and then exact accountability. I, surely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, um, Mr. Conyers, I'd love to have you participate if you'd like. Oh, thank you, uh, Chairman Shays. It's uh, good to be here uh, uh, before with the uh, formerly the Government Operations Committee. And uh, I don't have any comments at this time. Uh, this is an interesting subject, and I'm I'm delighted that you would allow me to sit with you. Uh, I'm hoping that. Uh, through the uh, good offices of, you, of yourself and this committee, we can find some common ground to uh, get this resolved. We don't, uh, it, it is not a federal government policy to single out some uh, community group and hang them out to dry about uh, accounting discrepancies, uh, uh, assuming that there are some. And I'm, I'm just here to uh, uh, honcho this thing along with you and if you asked me to become the chairman again of the subcommittee I'd be happy to except for a limited time for this <laughs> purpose of this everybody. hearing but other than that I don't have a thing to offer the challenge Mr. Conyers that we have is that we intended only to have one hearing and uh, we were basically told things that weren't true by HUD and by others who participated in the first hearing and uh, that necessitated further investigation and the reason why I'm not smiling right now is I'm not happy that we have to have a second hearing yeah. and I want to assure both of you because I know very sincerely that you believe uh, that uh, tenant organizations need to be empowered and that we need to do more not less and it would be hypocritical of any Republican in my judgment to, to uh, suggest that somehow we shouldn't empower people. That's a word that we all use. The real question is, with the limited funds available, were they being used properly and so on? So that's hopefully what we intend to get at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to assure you that I know that that's what you right. believe as well as we. I do. Thank I you, do. sir. I thank you for saying that. Uh, just one last point, and then we're going to get on to our next witness, unless you have any others. Um, I, I know Mr. Davis asked you this question about the, the potential that, that HUD uh, interacted with other organizations to try to complement their testimony before this committee. And I'm interested, if you could be more specific, what, what exactly are you suggesting? Um, we have a copy of an email message 
um, that talks about uh, the advisability of someone from HUD getting in touch with Maxine Green. Um, Could you get that memo and would you read it, please? Let me just ask you if this is the memo. It's an email. Could There's you say a message. Who, who it's from, who it's to, and what it is? This is a message from Patricia S. Arnato to Paula O. Blunt. And will you identify those people? Yes. Uh, Patricia Arnato was the Deputy Director for Program Development in PIH. I don't know Paula Blunt's title. Can someone help me? Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary. Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary. Um, Chris, the subject, testimony. Chris mentioned we should try to at least have input into the testimony of Bertha and Maxine. I know what there, and that's misspelled. I suppose it's supposed to be T-H-E-I-R. Their issues are generally, but want to discuss how we propose what P-I-H slash Kevin wants. Let's discuss. From that because of this message that we found. Did you identify the, the last names of the two people that were in Bertha and so on? Uh, Bertha Gilkery and Maxine Green were Thank the you. two persons who were to testify at your right. November uh, hearing. So it's the basis of this email. And, and is there this any was, other? This, date, this email was, I'm sorry, was dated 11 to 95. Thank you. Was there anything besides this that, that led you to believe that there was uh, an attempt to, to influence the testimony uh, before this committee? Yes, well, we have interviewed um, <coughs> Pat Arnato on numerous occasions, and uh, her testimony, her statements have changed quite significantly during the course of those interviews. Her last statement is that, in fact, she was in touch with Maxine Green uh, prior to the uh, that she was hearing, or wasn't I didn't. was was for the purpose of making sure that Maxine Green in her testimony was being accurate from a programmatic point of view. We have telephone records both from the office and Miss Arnato's home phone number uh, listing many calls to Maxine Green during the period immediately before the November 9th hearing. Thank you. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say before the committee? I noticed that you did not uh, uh, share with us your four recommendations. Um, and I think that uh, uh, given all the work you've done, you may want to just share what you recommend. We have recommended, uh, and I think this goes to many of the comments that were made here, that HUD needs to uh, institute a system of controls over its the entities it's doing uh, business with over its participation in outside conferences and conventions. <coughs> it, from what we have seen, the system that is in place gives us no assurance that we are spending money wisely in that regard. We are recommending that HUD issue a reprimand or other administrative action to the Puerto Rican Housing Authority regarding the solicitation of contractor contributions. We are recommending that HUD sever all relations with NTO until we establish what its legal standing is, what its tax standing is, what its constituent base is. And I would further, although we haven't made that recommendation explicitly, certainly HUD should be doing that with all of the groups that it is doing business with, not just NTO. And finally, uh, we're making a recommendation that's, that seems so obvious, uh, and that is that HUD needs to have a system of communicating within HUD that if action is taking it against an individual in one program area and they're doing business in another program area, the other program area at least finds out about it. They seem like logical recommendations, and I thank you for them. And, and let me say, um, um, I know you have done very thorough work. I know you've worked very hard. You've made a contribution to this committee. And I also know that this isn't always a pleasant experience for you, uh, having to come before a committee and, and sharing information like this. And so uh, uh, with that, um, I thank you. And thank uh, we'll you. get on to our next witness.
Our next uh, panel is Maxine Green and Miguel Rodriguez. Uh, Maxine Green is the president of the National Tenant Organization, and Miguel Rodriguez is executive director of Puerto Rican Public Housing Authority. Uh, and I welcome both witnesses to come uh, uh, to the, the witness table, and uh, we welcome their testimony. If they'd remain standing. If, you, if there's anyone from the Public Housing Authority that you would like to have uh, share testimony, I would welcome them to participate, and they would be sworn in as well. So we just want to identify who they would be. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I will have somebody who's going to be by my side just to help me in translation when English becomes Fine. difficult for me. Um, I'm uncertain whether an individual like that would be sworn in or not. So it would just be for translation purposes. Just for yes. that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you both would raise your right hand and uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And for the record, we'll note that both have answered in the affirmative and welcome you to, to sit down. And I'm just going to make a, a please be seated. One time at a HUD hearing, I um, asked a number of questions of someone. And when I saw it on TV that night, I cried because I felt that I had been unfair to the witnesses. I, I try to remember that someday I might be on the other side of the table. Uh, we want to be fair to both witnesses before us. And I say that to you, Ms. Green, and to you, Ms. Rod Mr. Rodriguez. I want to make sure that you have time to say whatever you want to say. I also want to say that uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, you are under oath, and uh, it is important that you be very clear on what you're saying. And um, I will also say that involved, when we did a major HUD investigation with Tom Lantos, the time people got most in trouble wasn't that they s shared embarrassing information or information that could cause a reprimand. They got in trouble because they simply didn't tell the truth and uh, ended up in a lot of trouble because of it. And, uh, I'm, just, I'm just saying that uh, if there is anything embarrassing, better that it be embarrassing than not truthful. Okay. And with that, um, Maxine Green, uh, uh, we'll, we'll start, excuse me, let me make sure, we'll start with your testimony uh, and welcome you here today. And, um, uh, and then we'll go to Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, one thing I'm going to have to request is you put the mic a little closer uh, just so we make sure we hear you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and to the Excuse members. Me, I, I've been, I want to make sure I do this before, and I have not. Uh, I first want to note that both witnesses answered in the affirmative on the terms of the oath, but then I want to just have unanimous consent. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statements in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection, so ordered. And I also ask unanimous consent that our witness be permitted our witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record, uh, and they can summarize. You can read your statement. Uh, we're not uh, uh, suggesting what you do, but uh, if you choose to summarize, your written statement will be in the record. Thank you. I'm sorry Thank to interrupt you. you. To the members of the subcommittee, my name is Maxine Green, and I am the chairman of the National Tenants Organization. I thank you for inviting me here today. But most importantly, I thank God for making it possible for me to be here today so that we might be able to solve this problem and hopefully get on with the work of the National Tenant Organization because the conditions in public and assisted housing are many. I came here to testify in reference to the NTO 1996 convention that was held in San Juan, Puerto Rico, August of 95. However, there were many other issues raised here today that I must address. It was raised about the disbarment, and I don't understand how that relates to the convention. I must state that the disbarment was of NTIS, and uh, prior to the disbarment, 
We were supposed to go to court to solve the problem. However, NTO was never privy to go to court, and the case was dismissed. In 1993, it was reopened again here uh, in Washington, D.C. to discuss what had happened uh, to the case previously. And after hearings and depositions and meetings and letters and faxes and et cetera, that case was also considered to be a dismissal based on my not accepting any activities with multifamily management or purchasing of properties. I had absolutely no intentions of purchasing or managing any HUD property. Therefore, I volunteered to be disbarred for that type of activity for two years so that I might function as the chairwoman of the National Tenant Organization. I understood that to be perfectly satisfactory to all officials of HUD. I worked very carefully with HUD. And the reason for that was we felt that we were building a, a partnership with HUD tenants and the executive directors throughout this nation so that we could improve programs that gave tenants greater opportunities to improve their lives. And that's why I thought we were working in harmony with HUD. I thought we were building that kind of partnership. So of the many questions that have been raised here today, that might have not been directed to the, con to the convention, I think, first of all, we must indicate for the records that the National Tenant Organization is not funded by HUD. We do not directly receive one penny from HUD, and they always indicate funding the letters that I receive they, they state, because of your funding, because of your request for funds, NTO do not receive any fund from the federal government. To question tenants and the amount of money that might be used for each of those participants, as they did question me, I informed the IGs that the information that they requested for me was utterly impossible for me to give them at all because they ask me the amount of money that each HUD participant receives uh, from the federal government when they're in travel. I'm not aware what their per diem might be. The only money that NTO is accountable for the amount is the registration for each tenant that attends NTO's convention, conference, or workshop. We must, however, make that clear, that we are a non-for-profit organization that is registered in the state of Florida as of 1995. I must also say that as far as what amount of money tenants are given when they travel, NTO could not make that information available to the IGs. I explained quite clearly to the IGs that I was uh, willing to cooperate in any way that I could. However, this information I could not give them. When they requested that I give them my membership list, I was uncomfortable to do that because when tenants are members of certain organizations, sometimes and most often, they are intimidated and harassed if they go to meetings and would rather not have their names listed as a member of any organization. And we felt it was the, the right to associate. And therefore, we could not at that time submit 
the list of members to the IGs. However, we said we have no problem in giving you the list of board members who are elected to represent tenants throughout the country. We have no problem in giving you the registration forms of all the tenants who attended the uh, NTO convention. And those councils who are affiliates of NTO, I cannot give you the members because each affiliate council represents the tenants who live in that particular co uh, council. So therefore, all of the members in the, in the state of Michigan, city of Detroit, each of those councils are represented as uh, uh, affiliates. And all of the tenants in the city of Detroit are members of NTO. And hopefully, Mr. Chairman, we'll be able to solve this problem. And then we can give some tenant assistance to the major problem that is going on in Detroit. I must also address the concerns of the IG when she spoke about telephone calls from my house to HUD or to HUD to me. I would like to ask a question. Is my phone tapped? I I'm concerned about that. Uh, how, how does she know who called me? That's a serious concern that I have. And I do not at any time deny the fact that I talk to Paternato on the telephone, evenings, afternoons, mornings, sometimes Saturdays. But all of those conversations was in reference to absolutely nothing that I thought was different because the, all of our conversations were in reference to what we might do in some of the workshops, what the agendas might be, who would we have attending, and, and information that was relevant to tenant work that came out of an initiative. So I don't have any reason to deny that, yes, I talked to Paternato on the telephone. But uh, this message that you read here today, I'm not very familiar with that one. I do have a statement I would like to, to address you from this partially. And as I go, I might have other references that I would like to make. Because I think that I might be doing an injustice to tenants around the country if I should not raise some of the major problems that they are confronted with. And because I was elected to be the spokesperson for tenants who live in public housing, I would like to, to address their concerns. The, the chair will show uh, some significant latitude in your testimony, but we do want it to address this conference. This is what the hearing yes. is about. Okay. Well, NTO is very proud of its contribution as a public housing advocate, including its role in the enactment of the Brook Amendment, the procedures for the election of tenants for tenant councils and policies regarding gun control and drug control in public housing. NTO's membership is composed of local tenant organizations <coughs> representing rep residents of the national public and assisted housing units that's administrated by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And to qualify to be an affiliate of the national tenant organization, you must have a democratically elected officers and your, the majority of whom must be tenants NTO has affiliates in all regions of the country, including Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. NTO's memberships include tenant groups such as the Citywide Council of Syracuse, low-income housing residents of the C.J. Pete Housing Council of New Orleans, and the tenant councils of New Jersey, the tenant councils of Hartford, and others. Mike, a little closer to you. It's, uh, when you're reading down it, yeah, that's, that'll help. NTO conventions and other acti activities are open to all tenants who are members of the NTO affiliates. 
NTO and its affiliates represent thousands of public housing tenants across the nation. It is ironic that this hearing occurs at the time when NTO is currently concerned with the massive efforts underway to dismantle the public housing program. While we understand that the committee's responsibility is to oversee HUD's supervision of all public housing expenditures, we believe that the investigation has distracted HUD's personnel and the NTO board from focusing on the true problem, literally the survival of public housing. The board of directors of the National Tenant Organization is elected by its members, and the board meets regularly in person or by telephone conferences at least once a quarter. As the chairwoman, I am responsible for carrying out the policies of NTO. I serve as the organization's primary representative and spokesperson. Because NTO has no salaried staff, I also coordinate all of NTO activities, do all the work for the board meetings, plan conventions and conferences, and handle all other administrative matters. I work for NTO full time without a salary. And much of that time is spent working with HUD, and we work around the clock talking about policy changes, the improvement of programs, and many other activities. Mm. NTO receives no funding from the federal, state, or local government entities. It relies m almost exclusively on membership dues and conference and convention registration fees to operate. NTO works both with tenants and housing authorities across the country to develop and implement strategies to help improve the living condition of citizens who reside in public and assisted housing. NTO has also endeavored to work closely with federal, state, and local officials, including secretaries of HUD from both political parties to help shape the housing policies, delivery system, and other programs developed to assist residents. To ensure that tenants are current on all federal programs, to bring information and to give them <laughs> the kind of information that's necessary to improve their lives. When we have conferences and conventions and speak about training, we do not endeavor a total training session. So when you talk about training, we must define what training is. Because if we have a conference or a convention, and these workshops relate to the issues, such as top programs, home ownership, 5-H programs, Section 8, Section 3, particularly in the last year, we had to talk about the blueprint and the downsizing of HUD and the budgets. And all of this means tenants must know what's going on. And that's what NTO is about, to inform the tenants throughout this nation about the kind of programs that are available for them to get the rules and regulations and all of the guidelines from HUD and disseminate that to them. To invite HUD's department to come and speak to the tenants on these kind of programs. Because I remember when we had our conference in 94 in Atlanta, it followed the HUD training program for TOP, which consisted of seven to 800 residents. And that workshop was so large that many of those tenants flowed over to the NTO conference and asked that we send a letter to the secretary asking that there be smaller 
workshops because they were just too big. That NTO should have training programs, training workshops that would give more assistance and understanding to those tenants who had not been involved in any programs before. And that's what we would like to do. We understand from your letter of invitation to this hearing that particular interests were going to be discussed for the 1995 NTO convention held last year in San Juan, Puerto Rico. At the outset, I advised you that the choice of Puerto Rico originated with the Puerto Rican delegation in 1994 at the conference in Atlanta where was their second request they had asked in, in the year before, but confirmed the following year. And the reason for that is Puerto Rico has the second largest population of residents. They have, it's my understanding, uh, 60,000, I think, units or 332 developments and a very active group of tenants and a very, uh, a very um, involved economic development training program. We were able to visit and find this to be a reality. We were very, very uh, happy that these tenants invited us there. And uh, I know that you have spoken about the uh, invitation that we sent out. But I think that when the invitation was read, the flyer that you selected to choose to talk about, there was a very, very important part of that flyer that was omitted. And at the very bottom of that, I think it states that if we could, if you would promise me that you would be on time for the workshops from 9 to 5, because it was important that you be there. That flyer was one of an announcement of seven pages. No one spoke about the page that said, we promise you the most constructive workshops and information that you will never forget. We didn't know, of course, at that time that this would be a convention that we would never forget. but. But I think we ought to think in terms of, you talked about the amount of money that we received, and I think it was less than the amount you have. But we're talking about a figure of, I think she said $35,000, oh, something in that neighborhood. And someone said to me that it was, oh, millions of dollars that have been spent on having this hearing. And Congressman Shays, I hope that's not true. I hope it's not true that that much Ms. money Ms. Green, could be spent on that convention. Green, yes? Uh, we're going to get nowhere <coughs> if you even insinuate for a minute that this committee is spending millions of dollars. No, I'm thing. asking. No, you are insinuating. And let me just say something. I'm willing to give you an honest chance, but we're not going to be intimidated by questions like that. The bottom line is we have had one hearing. We wanted to end that hearing. We did not have you present at that hearing, though you were invited. And we got answers that were simply not true. Now, this hearing may last longer if we don't get answers. And I want to make sure you keep addressing, to the best of your ability, why you are here under oath. Please address this hearing and why you are here. And then we're going to get to, to the next speaker. And we have two other panels after you. And we will be asking you some extensive questions. So as soon as you're finished, <coughs> we'd like to ask you some questions. Thank you very much. For the record, I would like to indicate that I was not present at the last conference because I was ill. And I sent that information to you. And I returned your ticket because I was not able to that be is the here. Why Thank you. Having a second hearing. OK. As, as, as far as the duplication is concerned, that was brought to my attention.
really the, the, the following paragraph deals with the information you have already as far as the kind of information that you were referring to. I am, however, going to leave with you a copy of my total and full statement that I would like for the record. Uh, the, partici the participation of tenant representatives at the NTO conference is supported by the local housing authorities and private resources often raised from churches and community groups as well. In 1995, HUD decided in advance of the convention that the cost of the tenants' at attendance was an allowable expense for the housing authorities so that two HUD letters that were related to the allowability of tenants' costs to the Puerto Rican Housing Authority, which was co-sponsored by the Housing Authority of Puerto Rico. The information was distributed with HUD support to various housing authorities. HUD provided NTO with some mailing la labels and two to 300 copies of convention announcement and packages were sent or, or were sent to me in Florida. Some of the information was faxed relating to the convention to various housing authority directors. HUD officials gave speeches at the convention and conducted training workshops and participated in the convention town hall meeting where they discussed with tenants various HUD initiatives and programs. HUD provided current descriptions of various HUD programs for distribution to the participation of tenants. NTO officers endeavored to plan and conduct a convention that was instructive and informative for the tenant representatives evaluations collected by the HUD Inspector General, which NTO obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, reflect that the vast majority of the conference participants found the convention to be helpful, informative, and productive. And with this background, I submit the statement I will be happy to respond to whatever questions the committee wishes to ask. Again, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Rodriguez, thank you for your patience. Uh, you now have the floor. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. With me today, Mr. Antonio Monroy. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. I will be addressing the National Tenant Organization Convention held in Puerto Rico. Within a year of my assuming the position of executive director of the Puerto Rico Public Housing Authority in March of 1994, it came to my attention that the 1995 NTO National Convention was being planned in Puerto Rico by the NTO with the cooperation of independent committee formed by private management agents who are the private contractor administering public housing developments and select residents. PRPHA became involved in the technical aspect of the conference, provided speakers and local expertise prior, and prior to and for the convention. Despite the inference to the contrary, made in preliminary finding number seven of HOT IG report, the convention did address substantive and training-oriented topics. While there may have been attendees in Puerto Rico with their own agendas, I can assure you that participants benefited from our sharing with them the experiences we gained from the many improvements to the public housing in the island. Since the beginning, we were carefully to restrict our expenditure to allowable uses. PRPHA made clear to NTO that our involvement with this convention would be limited to the payment of registration fees so that the PRPHA tenants could attend seminars and training sessions. Approximately $30,000 were to be paid so that 100 PRPHA tenants could attend the convention. Incidentally, this money has never been paid. 
at have never been paid, Mr. Chairman. And it was to be paid to whom? To the NTO for the expenditures uh, which are allow allowable, as, as I mentioned, expenditure related to conference and, and, and seminars attending. Not yet, sir. And why hasn't it been paid? Uh, an appropriate re uh, invoice yet. Okay. If you do, are you going to be paying it? If the invoice comes accordingly to the federal and state regulations and do not well, violate well, any, okay, we will we'll be... We'll pursue that later, though. But your point is that the 30000 has was intended payment but hasn't yet been paid. Been paid. Thank you. At this time, I would like to address the allegation that the PRPHA solicited donations from businesses awarded public housing contracts. <coughs> Prior to the convention, organizing committee members discussed funding for activities for the convention. Pursuant to a request from the private managers, PRPHA participated in these meetings. At a meeting, a management agent on his own initiative suggested that private managers offered to privately sponsor a convention event. While a member of my staff was present during this discussion, he in no way asked, encouraged, nor pressured private managers to donate funds for the event. Some confusion may have resulted from a misinterpretation of two letters written prior to the convention. The first written to Mrs. Maxine Green by myself dated the 28th of July, in which I committed to pay for a lunch with money raised from private donations. I believe this letter related to a meeting of organizing committee members in July, in which it was suggested that private managers should solicit donations from corporations not related to public housing industry, such as Coca-Cola, Ford Motor Company, et al. The management agents eventually rejected the idea of raising funds from corporate sponsors due to insufficient time. A second letter written by Carlos Ruben Rodriguez, a member of PRPHA press staff, has also been misconstrued. In this letter, he provided a summary of issues discussed, such as the request for private funds suggested by a management agent representative. Simply stated, a member of the PRPHA press staff attended a meeting where a private funds were solicited by a private contractor, and the president subsequently wrote a letter summarizing the meeting. There was never any intention, no desire on the part of the PRPHA to solicit, solicit funds from the private contractors. Chairman Chase and members of the committee, this concludes my statement, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Martini? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And um, me so much let me begin by uh, directing some of my inquiries to uh, Ms. Green. Ms. Green, th this, uh, this panel uh, was uh, uh, called together to make inquiry on this matter back, uh, back in the fall. It all began with the flyer promoting uh, this particular convention. And I think you just mentioned a moment ago, correct me if I'm not mis mistaken in understanding your testimony, but you stated that the NTO had been given about 300 of these flyers to distribute to promote this convention. Is that correct? No, that isn't what I said. Uh, I thought that was my recollection. I said there were duplications of the entire package, not just that piece. Well, but that was part of the package. Okay. Included in the package was the that flyer. That was well. part of it, yes. And those packages were circulated by you to your members uh, as a way of uh, presenting this uh, uh, convention to them, correct? That is correct. Uh, uh, who actually designed the flyer? I mean, the actual information, because that's what began I did. this entire process. I did. You did, okay. And um, the packet that was utilized was also put together by you? Yes. All right. Who at HUD participated in that process? No one. Right. No one at HUD participated in putting that together. Okay. The flyer itself had been, uh, had been reviewed by HUD prior to you putting it in the packet? I don't know if they reviewed it before it went in the package. I didn't give it to them to review before the package. Right. Uh, well, here's where the, my confusion comes in. A moment ago, I believe you testified that, that uh, HUD 
gave NTO this packet which included the flyer? Duplicated it. We had already sent it out and we were in HUD for that meeting that was just talked about where the letter of allowable expense was composed and given to me. And it was duplicated with those two letters. You're referring to the letter in June. That is correct. The letter in June. So this, so this flyer had been already, in order for it to be duplicated at that, that time, is correct. the flyer had to be exist in that, existence it at was, that time. That is correct. And this was during a meeting in which you participated uh, in getting the authorization letter as, as well, correct? The authorization letter of allowable expense, that's correct. And during that process, as you've just testified to, this is when this flyer was also available for duplication, correct? These not are at that meeting, not in the right. meeting, no. All right. When was the flyer uh, first? In, Some, who, someone might have received it. I don't know. All right. You're saying under oath today that the flyer was the product solely of you and NTO, correct? Yes. All right. And you're saying under oath today uh, that HUD did not assist in any way in coming up with or reviewing that flyer? That is correct. All right. And the flyer was uh, part of the, was in existence though in June during the time of this yes, it was. packet. Um, you've run many of these conferences before, NTO I should say, that has hosted correct. many of these seminars or conferences for tenant training before, correct? Correct. Uh, do you have some recollection approximately of how many seminars or training sessions like this NTO has, has uh, uh, operated or run since its existence? How and many? Uh, I'm asking for From 1968, maybe three per year, I'm not sure. All right. Um, you understood, did you not, that, and that's what this, this letter of June 26 from HUD is all about that HUD wrote that letter to the tenants indicating that this was an authorized expenditure by the tenants to attend this conference, correct? That's correct. And part of your function in hosting a conference like this is the need to have HUD authorize uh, this and sanction it so that the tenants can in fact attend, correct? We never had that before. Well, this letter isn't... Sorry, I hear the response we never had that before all of the questions about allowable expenses. I think there might have one, been one letter uh, previously, but that has not been the norm where a letter came out of from anyone saying that it was an allowable expense to my knowledge. Just to be specific, the letter that I'm referring to is the one dated June 27, 1995 by Mr. Moses in which he says in the last paragraph, as HUD has indicated in previous years for such resident training conferences, this NTO convention is an allowable training activity for resident leaders and their housing authority partners for reimbursement under public housing funds, including but not limited to operating subsidy, comprehensive grant program, top or other HUD funds. Are, is it my understanding from your last statement that this was the first time that a letter of this nature w was, uh, to your knowledge anyhow, drafted uh, authorizing tenants to attend with these use of public funds? It was the only letter of that nature that had ever been given to me, but I don't know if that's the only letter that ever went out to organizations that it was an allowable expense. Well, you understood. Are, aside from the letter, let's, ex let's put the letter aside for a moment. You had an understanding that in order for tenants to attend with the use of public funds, taxpayers' dollars, that you would have to have some approval in whatever form or authorization or certification in whatever form, verbal or written, from HUD, correct? No, that is not correct. Uh, in my understanding, there has been many conferences and many workshops and many activities that tenants travel to, and I'm not aware what kind of allowable letter came out of HUD. Now, they might have had that kind of a letter and sent it to the Housing Authority. I'm not sure. I know that, that, that wasn't That wasn't really my question. Let me try to make it even simpler for you. You understood, did you not, that you needed to have some verbal 
approval in the slightest form from HUD in order to No, host I didn't understand that. Yeah, well, you were you were in conversations with HUD officials before you went ahead with this convention, correct? No. You were, you were never in conversations with Mr. Moses with respect not, to this? Not before we planned our conference. Well, we had meetings, but no, we were not. Well, you had meetings. And what was discussed in the meetings with the HUD officials uh, about your conference that you were scheduling for August? Would you repeat the question, please? What were, my point is you had a, you had a convention scheduled for August. Mm -hmm. You've had, you had meetings prior to August with people at HUD. Mm -hmm. What then was the purpose and what was the substance of the conversations you had with the officials at HUD? Whatever the meeting might have been that HUD invited us to attend, such as that co-steering committee that we had, I don't know. HUD was never responsible with us for planning a, a conference. This letter was addressed to you, the June 27, 1995 letter was addressed to you uh, by Mr. Moses. Is this the first time you have a recollection of ever receiving a letter from HUD uh, with regard to That's the first time. one of your training or conventions or, or annual training report, training sessions? Yes. That is the first time. In the past when you held conventions, you, did never, you never received a letter to this effect? I didn't or know. similar in nature. Not that right. kind of a letter. Uh, did you understand that, uh, did you have any understanding that at the convention such as this there were limitations in terms of political advocacy that would occur at the convention itself? I didn't understand this to be a different conference than we have ever had before. Is I, it, I, based on what you just said, or all of your conferences as the ones you had before, would include uh, speeches and, and much of the advocacy that occurred at this convention? Yes. Right. Let me just uh, make reference to the Inspector General's report where... Shield one quick second. Sure. This is a convention you had, but it was um, billed as a training session funded with HUD dollars. Now, we're not That's incorrect. What is incorrect? This was a convention, and at the convention, those issues were discussed in various workshops. So your testimony is this, and I will get back to the gentleman's time. Your testimony is this. This was a convention of your organization that was funded by HUD through registration fees. Is it that was not funded by HUD. Where do you think those registration fees came from, ma'am? But we, Excuse we me, where do you think those registration fees came from? Some from of them might have come from people who didn't get funds at all from No, HUD. where they but came the from, no, where, they ca where they came from was from the taxpayers. They came from the taxpayers in payment out of funds designated for training. And these funds were going to an organization, a convention. That's the point that I just don't want to get lost in this process. I yield back. Well, and, and that's the point I was, I was going towards, Mr. Chairman. The Inspector General said in her report, and I quote, the actual NTO conference events were primarily geared towards political lobbying, rallying against public, uh, Republican public housing proposals, and for NTO-supported program proposals. Now, this is, this, this is my question. This was the Inspector General's report based on her investigation. The question I have of you is, did you understand that at a convention such as the one you had, which was supposed to be a training session, there were limits in terms of or prohibitions to having political advocacy. It's my understanding that we had a convention where we had workshops that dealt with the issues that are on that agenda that were addressed in workshops that dealt with the particular programs. And if we could be, maybe you could clear my mind Define to me what type of training are we referring to? Well, I'm not referring to training. I'm referring to oh. the Inspector General's report, which concluded that there was clearly an emphasis on political advocacy and not training. And, you know, if we want to talk about what her conclusions were, we heard a moment ago her referral to this as a scam. I didn't say it, but that's her conclusion on testimony just a moment ago. 
But before we get to that, let me just try to clarify Did one point. Uh, uh, conclude. We're leaving in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hold on well, well, if I may, Ms. Green, I will conclude in this line of question. I just resent the fact that she referred to our convention as a scam. Oh. And I would like for her to give a definition to the tenants around this country. What is a scam? Ms. Green, Ms. No, Green. no, you no, asked no. me that. I didn't I ask you the question. Know. I didn't ask you that. That was an independent What's investigator that made that uh, reference a moment ago. And uh, based on okay. the facts and, and evidence that she had disclosed in the course okay. of a very lengthy, detailed investigation. But yeah, you but keep how? insisting that there was not f these were not funds from HUD. Let's, let's clarify this for the public out there because I think it's very important. Basically, basically, the people who attended that convention, which was supposed to be a training workshop, did so on taxpayers' dollars that came out of HUD funds, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And in fact, the letter that I've referred to several times is a letter by Mr. Moses, which in effect gives some sanction to the program that you were putting on and saying that it's addressed to you. Yes. And it's saying to you that this would be authorized uh, use of those funds, correct? That's what the letter that said. That was what the letter okay. said, yes. Did you, when you went out and sent your packets to the tenants, did you or did you not, in your packet of information, tell the tenants that they'd have a right to use HUD funds or top funds or any other public funds to attend your conference? Yes, we did that. Okay. So then, in effect, HUD funds, as you knew, were being used because you had the approval of HUD to use HUD funds. Correct? Yes, we knew that. So that when you sit here and say repeatedly these were not HUD funds, in effect, HUD that, funds were the vehicle by which... That is not what I said. In effect, HUD funds were the vehicle by which these people attended this convention, which this inspector general a moment ago concluded, not me, was a scam. Correct? That's what she concluded. That's all I'm How, asking. However, that what I must say that the funds yeah. did not come to NTO as funding NTO. Tenants have the right to use the funds to go wherever they mm -hmm. feel they would like to go to use the yeah. money to participate in these type of sessions. And I have been questioned by that. And when we question this, I'm just saying I don't understand the difference in the money coming to NTO for a service as it does to anyone else for a the service. The challenge we have, Ms. Green, is that we want to establish some facts that we can all agree on. And basically, and so we can get beyond that issue, basically, these were taxpayers' dollars. Now we have to decide whether they were money well spent, and that's the purpose of this hearing. Now, um, Mr. Towns, you, you're going to have uh, close to 15 minutes. Uh, I try uh, not to use this. But you have that privilege. I wear, wear the fact that the House is out of session, everybody else is going home. Well, I understand we're not. all that, and we're here. So we're I, here. I'm going to try to. I'm I don't want to have a third day of hearing, sir. Yeah, I understand that. I'm going to try to cooperate with you as much as I can. You know, but I'm almost, I almost feel that I'm in a different hearing. Uh, the fact that I'm hearing some things that uh, uh, that's been said that really I didn't get that in the initial kind of comment that was made. You know, uh, when you use the word political advocacy, I think we might be using it too loose based on what was said here earlier by the uh, Inspector General. Uh, she indicated the fact that a comment was made in reference to uh, the Speaker of the House, she indicated. But let me say to you that any time you go to a conference and you read the newspaper about the day's events, or whatever might be happening, you stand up and you might make a comment about it. But that does not mean that that's a political rally. Uh, there's some comments made on the floor of the House to the point where words have to be knocked down because of the fact that somebody said something that they should not have said. And, and sometimes they say it and I can't get over it and knock them down. But the point is that, you know, I think that we might, we might be sort of taking this a little bit too far. You know, uh, uh, and we talk about top funds. You know, top funds are something that's new. I mean, this was not something that's been going on for a whole lot of years, and th therefore there's a long history yeah, okay. in terms of how we deal with these things. Yeah, I think that we have to put that in the proper uh, uh, context as we uh, 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 look at this situation that we're dealing with. I think there's some questions that, you know, that, that are appropriate, and, um, and I think that what we would like to ask uh, Mrs. Green, um, first of all, in terms of, did you have any guidelines as to what you could do or what you could not do? Uh, because uh, 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 the flyer that everybody is so excited about, I looked at that flyer, and I belong to a lot of organizations. 
and that it seemed to me that to say that after you do your work that we might have some fun, I mean, that's the kind of conference that I always attend. You know, I, I want to do some work, and after I do the work, I want to go, and then, of course, you know, and I think that I saw something said from 9 to 5, you know, we work, and after that, you come on time, and, you know, we will have uh, some other activities. To me, that's normal for a conference. I mean, you know, professional groups do this all the time, you know, and uh, I think that uh, we have to be open and honest about it. I also see something here, too, that we keep saying that HUD funds, HUD, but I think that money came from a lot of different places. I mean, uh, 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 some people, based on what I'm hearing, actually paid their, their own way, their own money. So this, these are activities that, that, that took place. So I don't want to, you know, sort of lose sight of that. So the question I have, Mrs. Green, is that were there any guidelines given to you as to what you could do because of this new top fund program that's now in place that we want to empower uh, tenants? Uh, did anybody say to you exactly what you could do? If so, I would like to hear your comment about that. That's the question that I have, number one, first. I don't have any specific guidelines about how we could have a convention, no. Uh, you, well, you're for the gentleman of Pennsylvania, yes. After you can finish it, I can ask a couple of questions. Sure. Who uh, would these guidelines be given to me by whom? That's the question I want to know. I mean, uh, did anybody give you guidelines? No. From anywhere, saying no. to you that this is what you could do. Now, no, this was an NTO convention, and we do not have any federal funds from anyone, and no one could tell us or gave us any uh, guidelines as to what we could do. Right. Will you acknowledge the fact that sometimes when we had conventions that we had conferences that somebody will stand up and make a statement and sometimes it comes from left field sometimes it comes from center field and sometimes it comes from almost out of the field no. uh, have you ever you ever attend conferences and you have that to happen that's true yes so if I looked at that tape and I saw in terms of somebody might stand up and make a comment then uh, that does not mean that NTO or you would be associated with that comment or be identified totally with that comment, that was a statement that was made at your convention. I think that's correct. Absolutely. All right, I'd like to yield Could to Jim. Could you just clarify one sure. thing? Was the, was the statement made by an NTO official? I don't know what statement you're referring to. No, the tape, the IG yeah, no. state, yeah, the uh, tape that the IG talked about, she said that somebody got it. up and I don't said know something what about, they said. Uh, about the, the Speaker of the House uh, Mr. Ginrich, she said. Uh, I'm not privy to the information on the tape, mm -hmm. and I really don't know what she's referring to until such time as I have seen the tape, I could answer that. Right. In other words, you, Maxine Green, did not make the statement. You know that. I know that. Right. I yield to Jim Pennsylvania. Th thank you uh, to the ranking member. Uh, let me uh, try to, because there's a lot going on here, and I, I think that the chairman legitimately is trying to get to the point about whether or not there's some better ways that we could use uh, resident initiative funds. But I do want to, I do think that it, it would be helpful for us to try to set the record straight on, on, a, on a couple of matters. Um, and one is on the point that you raised about political advocacy. I mean, it is perfectly appropriate for any person in America to state whatever they feel about political circumstances at the time. And if you would go to some of the tenant meetings in years when Democrats are in charge, you would hear them complaining about Democratic uh, priorities as it relates to public housing. Uh, and I, so I think they're at least equal opportunity uh, uh, critics on, on these matters. So if you go back through the years. So, but I want to ask about this to get to the heart of this, because part of what the majority has been promoting here is that we should have local control over decision making uh, for the use of uh, public housing dollars. All of the tenants who came got original authority to come through their local housing authorities for those yeah. dollars to be reimbursed. Is that correct? That's correct. And so that, that part of what is going on here is that it's not just Mrs. Green's decision to have a conference and she controlled the decisions of everybody else in this process to come to Puerto Rico for this meeting. There are literally dozens and dozens of housing authorities across the country, all of whom are politically appointed by big, important people who made decisions that this was a worthwhile activity in order to have tenant leaders uh, in their various cities and in communities to go and participate in this. 
And so that if the committee wants to find fault or harm, I mean, I think that we have to make sure that we are looking at the people who are really in the business of making these decisions. The, the second thing that I would say is that in terms of this issue about whether this was a convention or whether this is training, we're acting as if they have to be mutually exclusive. I want to make sure that the record is clear, that when the American Bar Association meets, when the National Bar Association meets, when other organizations meet, they have the meeting of their organization as part of that activity, and they also have continuing education, or what you might want to call training, that takes place usually on the site of the convention to coincide with the uh, participation of so many people of like mind, and that those training sessions are in fact the scam that is used for them to write off that trip on their taxes, and so that they're using tax money to pay for what are essentially conventions of their organization, and they're also using common sense, saying, well, since we're here, we have to get this training done, that we're going to do that. So the suggestion that you cannot tie these two things together and have them stand the legal test of scrutiny, it happens all the time. And I think that we just need to play by one set of rules. And I agree with the gentleman, but I have to reclaim my time. Uh, let, let me, because I want to ask Mr. Rodriguez a couple of questions, but I think it's an eloquent statement. Um, you know, I realize, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, that you're concerned about the Inspector General's finding that you solicited money from the Puerto, Rican Ho Puerto Rico Housing Authority contractors. Uh, did you solicit any money for the NTO convention from contractors that are doing business with the Housing Authority? I did not. What efforts are you currently making to clear up the matter? Are you working on clearing it up? We are, we are working on the matter in order to clear it because we think it is something that should, should be clear for the record and for hot records too. What now? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last one. We are trying to clarify the whole matter with hot. Yes. And in this session of the subcommittee, because we think it is very important that everybody knows that, that those allegations were, were not true. It, it didn't happen. Thank, thank you. Uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back and um, uh, uh, because I know we have other members that, uh, that want to participate, and I know you want to participate. Uh, but uh, I, I'm hoping that we just deal, you know, with the matters that actually that we have questions about, which is the issue in terms of uh, that we started out with, because you know uh, uh, we're talking about uh, a flyer, we're talking about a lot of things here, and of course um, we're talking about um, uh, the incorporation status and we, on all these kind of things, and I think that. Uh, 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 we've sort of had the most of this sort of answered, you know, to my satisfaction at this point. I think we've gone about as far as we can go. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Um, just to establish for the record again, uh, the IG estimated that the PHAs contributed $203,000. Top grants, the IG uh, 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 the, the estimates that the sum was, in fact, $85,437. The management agent contributions, that's the issue, Mr. Rodriguez, that we need to talk to you about, was $32,000. It, 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 it happened. There were $32,000. We're going to find out who solicited that money and why. HUD contributed $5,646. NTO contributed $3,207. And other private funds were $5,863. So let's just get beyond the garbage of what, who did, and who didn't. Private funds were practically nil. This was almost all government money. I would hope in this hearing we can at least accept these numbers unless you have numbers to dispute them. Ms. Green, do you have any numbers to dispute this? I don't have any numbers. I'm not, I'm, I'm not privy to how any of the money was raised. Excuse, I can't excuse, answer that. Okay. You do agree that you received $250 per participant, is that correct? No. No? The registration fee was $225 per 
per person okay. and not all people registered and paid their registration fee. I do not have any figures that show me that 260 people registered at that convention. Ms. Green, how much money did you raise in registration? The approximate, and I say approximate amount now, under was... Under oath is what you're saying. Yes, I, want you, I want you to be careful. Approximately 32 or $33,000. Okay. Not 40000 or forty. I would say not to my knowledge. Okay. I would like your number. And it would seem to me if you came to a hearing, you would be able to tell us exactly, precisely how much money you got in registration fees. Not a, not a, 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 a difficult question to either ask or to answer. What was the amount you collected in registration fees? I can only answer as I just did. Would I you? do not have the accurate amount the financial records that were taken at that conference. Why not? Because the secretary had the records and she since said that she had a fire and I don't have the records and therefore I cannot you give you... You do not have the records because of a fire because of a secretary. Your estimate of the amount you collected was how much? Between thirty-two and thirty-three thousand. Thank you. Um, I need to be clear uh, as to what HUD knew and when it knew it. And I need to be clear on, on the email and th that issue as well. And I first want to ask you is you basically had a document that was, what, six pages? Your attorney, I think, has provided us a document, numbers f seven pages, 440 to to uh, 446. It's a seven-page document. Yes. Now, this document was sent to whom? Tenants across the country okay. to some executive directors. Um, did you give this document to Mr. Moses? I did not give it to Mr. Moses in his hand. I left it in the Office of Resident Initiatives. Uh, did you... Ad uh, when was that? When did you leave that? I think it was June 27th mm -hmm. that I left it there. Did you send a letter to Mr. Moses, including this document? Later. June 20th. The first mailing went out, might have been mailed to Mr. Moses in attachment to the invitation of his being invited to the conference, uh, the, the, which the, did not include yeah, maybe, that seventh page. Let me just read page. you this letter. Dear okay. Mr. Moses, you crossed out Mr. Moses, wrote Ed. As okay. you know, the, tenet, uh, the National Tenants Organization will celebrate its 27th year at our national convention in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. The dates are Sunday, August 20th through Thursday, August 24th. I have enclosed a copy of the convention material for your information with the hope that you will, as you have in the past, support this event to the fullest extent possible. Is that uh, bring back a memory? memory? Yes. Okay. And what did you enclose? The announcement that you have, not including the two letters that were signed by Mr. Moses. Was it the seven-page document? It was the document you have in your hand that do not include the letters from Mr. Moses. But it included the National Tenant uh, Organization 1995 Convention, uh, the one talking about the vacation and so on. If that's, yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, um, I want to nail down what this $32,000 was. I want to nail down who, so I don't want, excuse me, I don't mean to speak so quickly. I would like to be very clear as to where this management agent contributions came from and who solicited these dollars. And I was a little nervous with your testimony when you said no one from your PHA solicited these funds. I think it would be more proper for you to say, since you are investigating, that to the best of your knowledge, no one from the PHA solicited these funds. We have testimony uh, from the IG that says your public uh, press person was involved in soliciting these funds. Is that not true? <coughs> Our public press person sent a summary of a meeting which he attended in which Mr. Frank Maldonado did solicit 
money from other private managers for some event during this convention. I have the letter you know, here. I don't, Mr. Rodriguez, I don't want to play games here. I uh -huh. mean, there's a $32,000 that was contributed for this NTO conference from people who do business with you. Now, I understand it's evidently not against the law, but it would be against HUD's regulations. If it is against HUD's regulations, we need to know about it, and you need to know about it. It would be wrong, though, for you to somehow suggest that you didn't do it if you did. So I want you to be very clear, careful. The question was asked, did you solicit any dollars? And I the did answer not. was no. The answer is, did anyone in HUD, to the best of your knowledge, solicit any dollars? In HUD? And, excuse me, in your, in your <coughs> PHA. As far, as far as I know personally, nobody else did solicit it. Okay. Where did this $32,000 come from and who raised it? The money, the money, the $32,000 that were indicated here, came from, up to my knowledge, private managers. That's not satisfactory. I want to know specifically where it came from. Which people made those contributions? I really do not have the information. Why not? I mean, you've been accused, I mean, seriously, you've been yes. accused of raising this money. I would think that you would want to know the next day where the heck this money came from, who solicited this money, and you would be able to give us a report. If it wasn't you, who was it? I mean, given the fact that we have a letter that says you're going to raise 32000 is it a coincidence? Oh, it happened oh, to be $32,000? For me, it is a coincidence. Well, it's not for me. Okay. Yeah. July 28th. Would you read that letter to this committee? Yes. It's to Ms. Maxine Green, President, National Tenant Association, and the subject is National Tenant Association Convention. Would you please read it? Yes. By entirety or...? or yep. To Ms. Maxine Green, President, National Tenant Association. Subject, National Tenant Association Convention. The PRPHA will co-sponsor the National Tenant Association Convention to be held in Puerto Rico during the week of August 20, 24, 1995. This co is limited to a maximum of $30,000. PRPHA funds to be used are from resident initiatives and will be used to pay for the Puerto Rican tenants attending the seminars at the convention. Okay, we now let me just interrupt you here. Now, that 30000 has not been paid. Not been paid, okay. sir. Now, why hasn't it been paid again? Because those invoices haven't come to our attention according to statutory and regulatory, uh, in, in a statutory and regulatory way. Okay, and what would be required? What, do the, what does NTO have to give you in order for you to make that payment? They have to provide the, by entirety all the names of the participants or signature and proof that they participated. Uh, that they Plus participate. all the pertinent information. And so that's all that's required. Once they give you a list of the participants, they're going to get $30,000? Once they give me a list that complies with all state and federal regulations. I just want to know what those are. What are the regulations? All you've told me is that it's, excuse me, I don't mean to talk so quickly, and I sincerely apologize. I can't even understand myself when I talk so quickly. The $30,000 has not been paid because you have said that it has to meet all the requirements. The only requirement you said to me was that they had to give you a list of the people who attended. That's a layup. A proof, what else do they have to give you? Mr. Chairman, and also proof of their attendance to the seminars and the meetings in where official business uh, were discussed. That's it? Up, up yeah. to my knowledge, and I can check for you. Yeah, Maxine Green, why haven't you submitted that, that list? That's, that's $30,000. Your organization is just going to be able to gobble up. We never submit a list of names to anyone to make a payment to NTO after a conference of people who did not attend. That was supposed to be for tenants who would attend. And in Puerto Rico, there were questions about the number of tenants that could attend, and that many did not come there. So, I see. So, so this is for this, Puerto Rico. Yeah, I'm sorry. This would be for those tenants that would attend or did attend. The bottom line, this would be for uh, participants would, in Puerto Rico, obviously. And, and you're saying you have no document of which tenants from Puerto Rico attended? Uh, yes, I have that, but... It so fell, all you have to do is submit those. It fell those. shorter than the amount. Well, but he will give you, obviously, something less than that, wouldn't he? Well, that he, we have. 
We have the name of people who attended yeah. and registered. Yeah, let me just go to the next point. I understand. The bottom line is you haven't submitted a bill. You haven't paid the bill. No, 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 no. Yeah. It was submitted. The registration for the Puerto Rican delegation yeah. was submitted in Puerto Rico, but the number of people that attended did not come to the amount we're okay. talking about. I think that you know we're talking about you know uh, two different things here. Yes. I'm going to we'll, take one and then the next. Yeah. What well, I mean, well, well, this one. Let me just say in terms of, um, as I understand this letter, what he's really saying is that we are prepared to cover up to this amount, but uh, and what 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 she's saying is I understand after reading this letter that that amount did not come so therefore that the money of thir round amount of thirty two thousand dollars the total amount they would not be entitled to it anyway because the point was that he said we will cover up to this amount with people attending thirty thousand yeah that's yeah. A, what thirty thousand but the next paragraph says we will also pay well, I'm, you know I'm, I'm trying to just sort out something you have a bill to submit you haven't paid a bill because it hasn't been submitted at least it hasn't caught in the basic document and the only document i hear no, you asking is you want to know what citizens from puerto rico excuse me what citizens from puerto rico attended once you know what housing, excuse me, what tenants from Puerto Rico attended, you will be making what? A payment of $225 per? If that invoice yeah. proof that they attended the convention, yeah. the seminars, because I state I very you. clearly, those are for seminars that are allowable expenses. I hear you. Bottom line, it, you haven't made the payment. You haven't the documentation to know which participants from the Public Housing Authority uh, tenants in Puerto Rico attended. Let me, if you would keep reading the letter. We will also pay for one of the lunches, lunches up to a maximum of $32,000. This money will be raised by private donations. Okay. This is a beaut of a sentence. Mm -hmm. It says we. Yes. We will also pay for one of the lunches up to a maximum of $32,000 this money will be raised by private donations. You're on real dangerous territory when you get into this area. Um, tell me exactly what your plan was, and then let's pursue what actually happened. Okay. We had, uh, we had this meeting with the organizing committee. They were uh, trying to make me uh, make a commitment to pay for almost every president uh, in a council every resident uh, which is a member of a council in the 332 different developments in the island and I really thought it was too much money and they also asked me if we then if we were not going to to send these residents uh, how were the residents going to partic participate in working launches well I told my residents back that we and when I May, when I say we, I am, I am thinking of the entire organization group, the committee, we're going to look for private donations. Okay. Um, the gentleman's name is? Uh, Carlos Rodriguez. Who is Carlos Rodriguez? Carlos Rodriguez is a press aide at, my, at the PRPHA. Okay. I am at a disadvantage since the letter is in Spanish. Um, I promised by the year 2000 that I would learn Spanish, but I still have a few more years to go. And um, the basic letter requests donations of $1,500 each from all of its new management agents to offset the cost of meals, lodging, and workshops in conjunction with NTO, PRA, the, the Puerto Rican Housing Authority Resident Management Conference. This, uh, the PRHA instructed the management agents to take the 1500 out of their management fees. Now, could you explain to me this letter? It is very difficult for me to translate, but I will try to explain <laughs> it. <coughs> this is a letter summarizing a meeting. First off, do you deny this letter exists? The letter is here. Yeah, yeah, okay. it and it does, in fact, does this letter solicit funds from private agents? I intend to demonstrate that this letter is not intended to solicit any funds from private managers. Okay. 
there were various, various issues discussed here. There is, there is a part of the letter, and I will say in Spanish and then try to translate, a very short statement. Ponerles al tanto sobre varios asuntos asistieron representantes. This letter is to let you know what happened on, the, on several issues in a meeting in which several representatives attended. This, this letter is talking okay. okay. Yes, sir. This is a summary. Uh, it is the letter of a press staff doing his job. He was present at the meeting and he was taking a minute. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, the only PRPHF representative of the committee. Uh, and the letter also makes clear reference to the solicitation of funds by representative agents in page number two. And, and I will say it in Spanish, I will try to keep it short. <coughs> Un comité de los representantes de algunas compañías concordaron en estar en la mejor disposición de hacer un donativo de 1.500 dólares por empresa a ser entregados en nuestra próxima reunión. A committee from the representative of some companies concord or accord to be in the best disposition to make a donation of 1,500 per, per management agent to be given in the next meeting. So you're basically saying they volunteered to do something wrong. Let, let me try to clarify. You know, why am I uncomfortable? No, no. I mean, you know, if you, if you didn't break the law and you're not going to jail for this, why, why are we stretching this out? Why are you making it painful for yourself and me? These individuals were solicited money. They, they basically Private. agreed to do it. And you're calling it a donation? They Pri basically agreed to break the rules. Well, private managers were, were asked by another private manager to donate or to give for the use of residents of public housing. Is this proper? Are you comfortable with this arrangement? Sir, it, not well, r right now, right now I don't think it is violating anything, but I am not feel good about this happening. Technically, the way you interpret, maybe it doesn't violate anything, but is this the way you should run or allow an, an operation to be done? No, sir. Okay, that's encouraging. Mr. Patan. I'll come Thank back. you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, um, as I would understand this, the tenants who came, they were approved by the local housing authorities to come and their, and their expenses were, were paid for by their local housing authorities. So whether it was from Hartford or Philadelphia or Chicago, that these local housing authorities agreed for some reason that this was an important enough activity and that they were going to sponsor some number of public housing tenants to come. So it's, it's of note that the committee is concerned about this invoice not being paid and not questioning about the invoices that were paid by all of these other housing authorities that paid invoices um, for people to come to the conference. Now, Mr. Rodriguez, you have a reputation for running a very good housing authority, and I want to, just so we're clear, you did provide a written statement to the committee. And as I read your statement, you spell out specifically how this uh, occurrence took place, where it says on page 7 of your statement, during one of these meetings, one of the administrative agents, Frank McDonald, okay, on his own initiative, suggested that private managers offer to privately sponsor a convention event. So notwithstanding what was, what was uh, the, the difficulty earlier, it was, in fact, in his written statement, an explanation, at least, for what he perceived to have taken place. Now, the private managers in, um, in your housing authority, have, have, are you aware of any of them um, that felt as though that they were improperly influenced to make such a contribution from someone on your staff? Could you repeat the last part of your question? Please? Has any private manager come forward to your knowledge to say that they were improperly or unduly harassed to make this contribution? No, they have not. Okay. And so the best of your information, this is how it took place. 
that this gentleman solicited from his colleagues. Since they're making, uh, they're making a living in this business, they wanted to put on a good, they thought it was in their business interest to make such a contribution. As far as I know, they thought that. Now, Mrs. Green, you've been having these conferences and training sessions for a long time. Yes. And as far as I know, and I know a little bit about this, tenants have been coming to these conferences for more than a decade. Oh, yes. And at each and every time that they've come, they've used the money that has now been described as HUD money yes. to come to these kinds of conferences. So this is not a new occurrence. No. Oh. You've had these conferences in a number of different locations. Yes. All across the country. That is correct. You had them when Secretary Jack Kent was the Secretary of HUD. Yes. And you had them when Patricia Harris was yes. Secretary and Samuel Pierce was Secretary. Yes. That tenants have been coming to these meetings. That is correct. And they've been using reimbursements from housing authorities to pay for their travel. And I'm hearing yeses and yeses and so on. I, we need to be sure if you're making this as a as a point. I'm just I'm just advising uh, our, our people here as well that if you are asking it, we need an answer. But a nod or a yeah yeah may be interpreted as a yes when it may not be true. And I want to make sure we're careful. I don't want you to go so quickly, because some of what you said may in fact not be true. And and the question is so I'd li if you didn't mind and I won't take from your time. You have plenty of time here. Some of a lot of what has been said here today may not be true. And, and so we just need to try to get to the facts. That's what I'm trying to walk through this. Tenants have been coming to these conventions and conferences for how long would you say, Mrs. Green? I would say that uh, you said the last decade is absolutely yes. correct. All right. And now, did they come to your conventions when Jack Kemp was the secretary? Mm -hmm. Yes. Was Jack Kemp the promoter of this? resident initiative notion that we should empower residents was that part of what he was saying as the secretary he was the promoter for he that. was he was very supportive of these kinds of Would of the just shield for a second i just want to make sure that jack kemp's name isn't taken in vain did he uh did he advocate that tenants attend your conferences there is a big difference I don't, I don't think i'm sorry mr. mr chairman yeah. first of all mr chairman i understand your concern because part of the reason why we're having this hearing is somebody said something about the speaker. But I didn't say that Jack Kemp did that. But the point that I'm making is that the reimbursements for tenants to travel, this. I'm not saying that this was entirely proper. I'm trying to make a point that these local housing, my local housing authority in Philadelphia, which is chaired by our mayor and other responsible people, made decisions that it was okay for tenants to come to these types of meetings. Now, my ma the mayor of my city is a Democrat. All right, so I'm not trying to, I'm trying to make a point that, that this is something that's been going on for a very long time. The All right? Started under, the gentleman yield, the initiative started under Jack Kemp. He would, this is the program yeah, that, that he this, put the, forward. Well, yes. it, was a, it was a major part, Jack Kemp's a friend of mine, major part of his focus was to push for resident management, resident leadership, giving technical support and assistance to tenants so that they could be in more of a, of a position to have control over their own circumstances. And as I re would recall, there were officials, maybe not Jack Kemp, but his top officials who participated in many of these similar types of conventions. Is that correct? That's correct. And the way I remember it, that Jack Kemp was the initiator of resident management and not only did tenants travel to these type of conferences, it was mandated that they go to those kind of conferences. But there were selected tenant groups that could call those meetings, as was indicated in the presentation from the IGs. Okay. I, I, I thank you, and I'm... I'm okay. Yeah, I want to. I want to yield my time back to the chairman because. Before you yield, I want to just add. Yes. I, I, could I just put something in the record? You know, um, in this letter here, this to, from Park Management Corporation, where it says other private managers present agreed with to co-sponsor this event. It is important to clarify that the Puerto Rico Public Housing Authority did not solicit donations from the management agent. I'd like for this to be included in the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, it will be included. 
I interrupted the gentleman a few times, and you do have more time if you'd like. I'll, I'll yield my time back. Okay. Uh, Mr. Martini. And try to clarify one or two things. Uh, first of all, in response to my colleague, Mr. Fatah's uh, uh, comments uh, a little bit ago about the philosophy here about uh, uh, delegating more authority on programs back to the government, I think it's important that everyone out there, including all of us, recognize the very reason we're here is not because of some comment uh, about uh, someone politically at the convention. The reason we're here is there were local officials in my hometown uh, who had expressed outrage and shock when they received this flyer, uh, one being a Democratic councilman in the city of Passaic, and when that was also brought to the attention of the uh, director of the HUD programs in that city, he denied the request of the tenants to attend such a convention. So we're here for that reason, and, and the inquiry initially, which was supposed to be very limited back in November, uh, has, uh, has developed into this inquiry because we did not have the fullest of cooperation and uh, necessitated a further inquiry by the Inspector General. So that's why we're here. I don't think it's significant at all whether it was Jack Kemp years ago or whoever it was years ago that tolerated the sloppy, inefficient practices that we have disclosed here in this hearing. It's very apparent to me that uh, contrary to maybe the feelings of some of my colleagues uh, on the other side here at this committee, at least the Secretary of, of HUD, Mr. Cisneros, who issued a press release a while ago as a result of this inquiry, has taken very serious steps with respect to the inefficient administration and the policies and most particularly, uh, I might say, he, uh, he is most importantly, these are his words, we are seriously weighing the Inspector General's recommendation that we sever all ties with the National Tenant Organization. Yet some up here are implying out here in this uh, inquiry that it's okay, the kind of inefficient practices that we've heard about NTO today. The fact that NTO is shocking to me was, uh, was, uh, was being disbarred or debarred uh, at the time that uh, for, for financial mismanagement and yet the people at HUD at the time thought uh, very little of that and continued to do business with NTO, NTO and yourself. So I'm pleased to see that uh, someone at the cabinet level uh, understands what the chairman here and myself have understood what this inquiry is all about and agrees with the initiatives that are coming out and some of the findings that are coming out and in fact supports the inspector general here. Now. Those are comments and responses. But let me ask one question of you, Ms. Green. What was the legal status of NTO in August of 1995? The legal status of NTO was the same in as it is without the incorporation, which was in December of 95. All right, so NTO became incorporated in December in of 1995. In the state of Florida, yes. Now, is it incorporated as a profit corporation? A nonprofit organization. All right, so it's, it comes under the, the, the titles of the statute that would designate it as a non -pro, non for profit corporation, correct? That is, that is right. correct. Prior to August of 1995, what was its legal status? Or in August of 1995, it was not a corporation. The corporation was uh, in 1981, whatever they stated at that time, um, it was. Uh, not in keeping with whatever in the District of D.C. Right. So from, 1990, from 1981 until December of 1995, mm -hmm. uh, there was a lapse in the status it of It was NPO. a voluntary organization. Okay. I'm sorry, what was it? Voluntary organization. I understand, but you're here with legal counsel today, is that correct? Yes. Uh, he would know, or, or perhaps he can assist you in this. I'm trying to determine... What was the legal status Excuse of me. NTO? Yes, I can clarify something, if I could, Mr. Yes, Chairman, yes, yes. because the gentleman indicated that some of us were trying to do something. I have stated clearly that it would be in the record that I was not suggesting that all that went on here was right. correct. And I also agree with the Chairman that any uh, misappro misappropriateness use of public funds was was wrong. But the point I was trying to make is that in 1981 and 82 and 83 and 84 and all through, when Jack Kemp and others were at HUD, tenants were going to these meetings. So I just want to be clear, and I'm glad to see that Secretary Cisneros has taken action. I just want to make sure that we are we clarify what the re real record is here. Right. Would you let me yield further? 
Let me say that you know what uh, the, the exact statement was that we support sloppiness. I mean, I, and that you know, I mean, I, 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 I general with you, I don't think I suggested you support sloppiness. Yeah, that, that was the word. That it was incorrect. Well, that's what you when said. When you said it, yeah. And I, so I want to let you know that you know we recognize the fact that this is a new program. There's growing pains, and that you know certain problems existed, and that we should be corrected. We we, we support that. Well, but, I'm, but I'm, the point I'm, is that I'm not going to get upset over some kind of flyer. I mean, the way, I mean, that, that's what we're talking about, well, that, 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 you know, that, that was out there. I mean, I think that you, that you might be overreacting to that, and that's the point I'm making. Well, yielding back my time, if I may, just uh, I, I'm, uh, one, appreciative of the fact that uh, hearing your comments, uh, I, as I, I, I certainly felt that you shared those uh, values as well, but this is more than a flyer. It was the flyer which precipitated what was supposed to have been a very limited inquiry, which turned out to be, and I'm pleased to see, an inquiry which has disclosed a lack of practices, and it was not my intent to suggest sloppiness or that they, my colleagues would condone sloppiness, but uh, f clearly the evidence has, uh, uh, has indicated uh, certainly a total lack of any kind of administrative uh, discipline or procedure or policy, and I, I blame most uh, the officials at HUD, uh, but I also have some troubles with the status and the legalities in the status of MTO. And I'm st uh, still waiting an answer to my question about what was the legal status of NTO in August of 1995. The legal status of NTO in August of 95 was volunteer non-for-profit organization. A letter from my lawyers to, your, to the staff of the chairman has been submitted, and I would like to submit it to the committee. Thank you. And the volunteer non-for-profit, um, volunteer non-for-profit status was it? Correct. August 1995. Okay. The 32,000 or thereabouts of uh, revenues that you received from this convention, uh, what happened to those? Excuse me. The 32,000 dollars of revenues that you testified to before or thereabouts that you received from this uh, convention, what happened to those? What happened to that sum of money? It was deposited to the bank. In whose account? The National Tenant Organization's right. account. And then was it, uh, what was it, was it, uh, you, it's, uh, was it utilized uh, for any expenses with respect to that convention? Yes, it was. The, um, just one moment, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Prior to the years 19 to, to well, up until now, has the uh, NTO filed a tax return? The answer to that question is in the letter that I'm submitting to you. Do we have a copy of that yes, one? Did that in fact? See, just one moment. You have a copy. I don't believe you do. I got this just before the hearing started, so I don't believe you do. Should we make it available? Mr. Towns, your staff has a copy. No, I, I don't mind, Council, if you want to, to, to be closer to, to... I have no problem with that if you... Okay. Any years prior to 1995, back to 19... I'm going to interrupt just because I'm going to try to gauge... The, how much more time does uh, the gentleman think he needs? Just a couple of minutes. No more time. Do you need him? No more. Okay, I'm going to have like two minutes. I'll be done. And if you want to follow up on a question, no thanks. Just uh, on this issue of tax returns, did the NTO uh, from the years... From 1981 to 1995, did they annually file a tax return? All the information is in the letter. Who are the other active officers of the NTO right now? A list was submitted. Provided. Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, uh, conclude by thanking you and thanking the other members for the opportunity to uh, make these important uh, inquiries of these witnesses. Thank you. I thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Green, I, I, I want to ask you uh, two lines of questions. First. You say that you do not receive a, a, a salary 
uh, for your work in NTO. Have you ever made personal payments to yourself, or do you ever make personal payments for rent out of the account of NTO? Rent is made out of NTO because that is the office as well as where I, I live. That's, uh, so when a payment is made, it's made uh, to reimburse you for part of the rent or all of the rent of the home? For all of it. So all of the rent, even though you live there? That is correct. So NTO covers your entire housing? For the rent, because I live there, I work there, I was sent there to do this. Yeah. That's, a, that's your, a little on dangerous territory there. Usually, you know, you have to take a little part, but uh, um, you are not... Um, the usual practice is that when you have a home, you are allowed to pay for possibly some of the cost, not all of the cost. I, I think that I must share with you that I work 24 hours a day for NTO no, I know you work all hard. the time. Yeah. I'm there all of the time. It isn't that I go into an office a couple of hours. I am there all the time doing work for NTO. Right. But you also live there. And I live there. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me just ask you one other question. Um, uh, I just need to have a, a clear record uh, under oath on, on this question. And we want to, th th there was an email uh, sent to Paula Blunt from Patricia Arnado, um, and it, who works at HUD, and it says, Chris mentioned, Chris spelled K-R-I-S, mentioned we should try to at least have input into the testimony of Bertha and Maxine. I know what their issues are generally, but want to discuss how we propose what PIH slash Kevin uh, wants. Let's discuss. Uh, did you have any uh, co uh, conversation with Patricia Arnardo about testimony that she might give or you might give before this committee? Absolutely not. Okay. Thank and you. I did not testify at that hearing. Uh, I, I, but I want you to be clear that, that you're under oath saying, and it's important because this is a, an email that would lead us to believe that there was some collusion between HUD and you as to what you would say. And it's your testimony that you had no conversations whatsoever with any officials at HUD regarding what you would say before this committee. Absolutely not. Okay. And you had no uh, conversation with any officials at HUD on what they would say. Absolutely not. Thank you very much. Um, does either uh, witness want to uh, make any other comment before we uh, adjourn? I know this has not been easy for uh, any of us, uh, particularly those uh, of you. Yes, Mr. Rivers. Mr. Chay, thank you for inviting me to this committee. And I hope I provided all the documentation and information you need. Yeah. In case you need anything additional, please uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, the one area I will just say is that I'm very troubled about the payment of 32000 and the coincidence of the letter and the amount that was actually sent to the hotel and the fact that we have people within your organization that uh, interacted with these individuals who made these contributions. We need to... Uh, to nail that down, so we will be uh, in touch with you further. And okay. I thank both of you for your gracious time and patience with this committee. Thank you. And we'll go on to our next panel. It needs to be happening. No, I'm not. Um, I am sorry. What time? Uh, I didn't. I'm not aware. But I got. I got to go. Midnight. I don't think. I, I don't think. It, I don't think we'll be very long with Kevin. Can you can you get a carry out for me? I had to go to this dinner. Can we say about this thirty two thousand? It cost me thirty two thousand. I said you thirty two thousand alone. No, 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 no. Our third panel will be called um uh, Ed Moses, Deputy Executive Director of Community Relations and Involvement, Chicago Housing Authority, and Patricia Arnardo, Deputy Director for Program Development, Department of Housing and Urban Development.
Uh, and for the record, I will say that Patricia Arnardo uh, requested that we impel her testimony today, and we respect that request uh, and appreciate the fact that she is here. Um, if both would remain standing so we could swear you in. Thank you very much. If you both would raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, both witnesses for the record have answered in the affirmative. And uh, with that, we'll proceed, uh, Mr. Moses, with your testimony. And uh, even though it is late and there are pressures, uh, you need to, to say whatever you want to say. And uh, uh, we want to be um, assure you that you will have your time to make whatever sure, statement you need it. To make, pardon me? Um, for, the, for the purpose, the only two people who will be uh, testifying will be the two witnesses that we swore in. That's fine. Then we don't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Towns. I think the person at the table could be, could he be identified? Uh, we could identify you, but my understanding is you, could you identify yourself, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman, my name is William Bransford. I'm Patricia Arnato's attorney. Right. You're welcome to be here. You are not a witness. We will not be asking you questions. You're more than, uh, we're more than happy to have you counsel your uh, client, but uh, th that's the extent of it. I understand. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Moses. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Towns, thank you very much for allowing me to speak before this committee regarding my knowledge of and involvement in a convention held in San Juan, Puerto Rico in August 1995, sponsored by the National Tenant Organization. My comments on this matter expound on my testimony of November 8th before this committee. Today I will provide more detail than I was able to provide in November 1995 hearing because of the time constraint. What follows are my recollections of the events surrounding my involvement in the NTO convention. During a resident ad hoc advisory committee meeting held sometimes in late winter or early spring of 1995, different members of the committee, which was comprised of several resident organizations, informed the group of dates and locations there of their upcoming conferences. The National Tenant Education slash Tenant Union was having this conference in Washington, D.C. in April. The National Association of Resident Management Corporation was having this conference in Memphis, Tennessee in August. And the National Tenant Organization was having this annual conference in Puerto Rico also in August. Additionally, some of the state organizations announced their conferences. This was the first time I became aware that the NTO intended to hold its annual conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico. In late May or early June 1995, NTO's president, Ms. Maxine Green, contacted me to request that HUD public and Indian housing staff participate in their conference. I informed Ms. Green that I believed that we would be willing to participate. The department had participated in every national group's conference since I arrived at HUD on August 16, 1993, uh, including the two previous NTO, NTO annual conference, and, but I also asked that she formally request our participation in writing. PIH received an official letter from NTO inviting us to participate in the conference on and about June 20, 1990. The letter included a working draft of a proposed agenda. Upon receipt of the letter, I indicate PIH's willingness to provide training as we have done in the previous conferences and assign my deputy to coordinate the efforts with NTO on PIH's involvement. I expect my deputy will flush out uh, HUD's portions of the agenda, ensure that our participation will be professional and geared toward providing substantive information on resident issues to the attendees of, a, of the conference. In those efforts, I anticipated there will be discussions and meetings with NTO representatives and my staff. The next meeting I had at time, the next time I had any contact with, with NTO concerning the conference was sometime later that month when Ms. Green requested that the PIH issue a letter indicating the public housing fund could be used to attend the conference. Ms. Green explained that she was making the request because some HUD field offices and public housing authorities were refusing to give residents funds for the conference. They were unsure of its eligibility, eligible expenditure of the housing fund. Over the last few years, it has been the practice of PIH to provide letters of this type so that residents could attend resident groups conferences if those conferences related in any significant way to the goals of the department resident initiatives programs or provided the department with an opportunity to present and or explain its policies and legislative efforts to our constituency, constituency with regards to the resident initiative programs and policies. On or about June 27, 1995, I signed a letter to this effect and it was subsequently sent to our field offices. About the same time, I received a call from the administrator 
slash executive director of the Puerto Rican Public Housing Authority, requesting that I set up a meeting with the NTO president and himself because he was interested in co-sponsoring the NTO convention in Puerto Rico. A number of his residents would be attending the convention and there would be some discussion about his program. He was concerned that the residents on the NTO conference committees were individuals with whom the housing authorities were with, at odds with. The PHA was working on a new request for proposals for the management of some of his properties and as a result of the private management companies were in danger of being um, displaced. The residents on the NTO conference committee were aligned with those private management companies who were in danger of losing their contracts. The, the administrator feared that these individuals would use this conference against the PHA. He therefore wanted to meet Mrs. Green to prevent the, P the PHA's side of the story. I told him that I would host a meeting if, if NTO consented. I placed the administrator on hold and dialed the NTO's president on my other line to see if she would agree. She concurred and they made arrangements to meet in my office on June 26, 1995. This phone call occurred during the week up or week prior to the meeting. On the date of the meeting, both parties had a frank discussion and came to an agreement on their relationship and the role of the housing authority at the NTO conference. Each asked me to formalize their agreement in writing, which I did. The next time I was contacted concerning the conference was in late July and early August 1995. I received three telephonic messages from individuals in, Det in Detroit, two from reporters, which I referred to NTO, and one from the director of the, the Detroit field, Public Housing Field Office, to which I responded. The reporters wanted information on the conference content, and the HUD director wanted to know how many persons per top group should be permitted to attend the conference. I informed the HUD Detroit field office director that the top guidelines allowed a maximum of three persons per grantee to attend the conference. Further, I told her it was within her discretion to set the limit per group up to three person uh, limit because she was in the best position to assess the local situation. I also received a telephone call from Councilman Gary Shear of Passaic, New Jersey, who is also a member of the P Public Housing Authority of the Board of Commissioners. The council was concerned about the residents of Passaic Housing Authority being allowed to attend the NTO conference. He was particularly concerned because the, PA, the Passaic PHA had a policy that its staff could only attend conferences within a 100-mile radius. I informed him that HUD did not have rules limiting travel based upon difference, distance, but that the PHA did not have to send any residents that they did not want him to, did not want to. He then explained to me that it was not the PHA's money that the resident wanted to use, but their own funds from their top grant. The residents were asking the PHA to advance them funds until they received their top monies. He wanted me to disallow this expenditure. I told him I could not restrict the residents' use of the funding in this manner because the top conference qualified as an allowable expense and there was no prohibition in our grant agreements with the residents, with the resident council which set a distant limitation on travel. At this juncture, Mr. Shear raised the question of the NTO promotional flyer. He proceeded to tell me of the flyer's content. I asked that he fax me a copy because I had not seen it. Mr. Schur told me that he would, would have the PHA exec executive director fax it to me. The PHA executive director is Eric Kobe. The executive director faxed me a copy of that fly, uh, the flyer that day, which was August 10, 1995. Upon receipt of the, of the fax, I called the NTO president complaining about the tone of the flyer. She informed me that she used a promotional flyer from a conference sponsored by a housing authority industry group in another resort location as a guide. The, time, the next time I recall having contact with any NTO members was during a resident ad hoc advisory committee meeting held in, on July 25th and 26th. This meeting was called to get the ad hoc, the, hoc committee's feedback on HUD's legislative submission and other proposed legislation on public housing. The major objective was to get a consensus and opinion from the group prior to HUD's submission of the, of the bill to Congress so we could incorporate acceptable suggestions in the bill. The meeting started at 1 p.m. On, on the 25th and ended around 12 noon the following day. It should be noted that while there is a possibility that NTO handed out literature regarding this conference during this meeting, I do not recall seeing a copy of the flyer nor having any discussions about the NTO conference. My final involvement in the NTO conference occurred in the conference itself. I arrived at the conference on Sunday, August 20th, 1995. I was picked up by the executive director of the Puerto Rican Housing Authority. We went to the conference site where I participated in the open session. After de delivering my remarks in the opening section, 
I checked into my hotel and then went with the administrator of the Puerto Rican Housing Authority to meet with the, with the Secretary of Housing for Puerto Rico, who wanted to discuss some issues concerning the agency efforts to get out of trouble status and what assistance the department could provide. After the meeting, I went out to dinner, and, and when I returned, I went to bed. I awakened the, next, the following morning, went to breakfast in the hotel, and at 10 a.m. delivered my keynote speech. After giving my speech, I stayed to hear the economic development workshop, which was showcasing some resident-owned businesses in Puerto Rico and a youth apprenticeship demonstration held in, uh, that was being undertaken in, in Philadelphia. When this workshop was over, I left to catch a flight home. I was taken to the airport by the HUD local field office uh, community relations and involvement staff person. Upon my return to the office, I submitted my receipts to my secretary to process my voucher. In closing, I would like to say that in retrospect, I would handle this matter differently today than I did at that time. During this period, I was, all, I was away from my office on HUD business a great deal of the time. And as a result, did not supervise these events on my staff as closely as I perhaps should. Since the conference, I have, made, have been made aware that there was information, distribu information distributed suggesting that HUD, rather than the Puerto Rico Housing Authority, was co sponsoring the conference. Specifically, the mailogram were sent out stating that NTO and HUD expected residents to attend the conference. If I had that information at the time, I would have pulled my office involvement in the conference. Further, where I was still a, a part of the department, I would develop a formal protocol for my office to use when dealing with resident conferences and conventions and institute title controls and providing guidance to resident groups in spending their top funding. Thank you again once again for allowing me the opportunity to address this committee. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Uh, uh, Ms. Ar Arnardo. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is uh, Patricia S. A. Arnato, and I have been Deputy Director of Program Development. That's the second deputy in the Department of Housing and Urban Development. On February 22, 1996, I received an invitation to testify in front of this committee regarding my knowledge of and involvement in a convention held in San Juan, Puerto Rico in August of 1995, sponsored by the National Tenants Organization. This is the first time I knew that this subcommittee contemplated calling me a witness at this time. I initially declined this invitation because of my discomfort connected with providing information in a public forum about the policies and practices of my employing agency. I'm particularly uncomfortable in describing events related to either my former or current supervisors. I've heard that some of my testify testimony may contradict statements made by others. My former supervisors remain actively associated with the housing industry. I am a loyal career federal employee and I do not enjoy publicly commenting about former or current, current departmental officials. Another reason I declined to testify is that HUD management did tell me this decision to testify is my own. Now I have received a subpoena. I am here because I am required to be here. I will fully cooperate and provide information that I hope is helpful. I first heard present background information describing my duties and responsibilities as Deputy Director for Program and Development. In First, I will present background information describing my duties and responsibilities as Deputy Director for Program Development in the Office of Community Relations and Involvement and how I came to that position. I have been a federal employee for over 28 years. Since 1975, I have been an employee at HUD. During my HUD tenure, I've been responsible for assessing housing programs and developing numerous regulations, handbooks, and training sessions for these programs. Beginning in the late 1980s, HUD determined that organizations representing the interests of tenants of public housing projects required hands-on technical assistance to move toward constructive activities in their developments. HUD issuances and management directives reflected this new role for HUD staff. This pro proactive technical assistance included ongoing guidance and help to public housing resident leaders either directly or through training conferences. Since 1989, departmental officials, both at headquarters and in the field, have provided assistance to national, regional, state, and local resident leaders in all types of capacity enhancement activities, including conferences, workshops, and technical assistance on-site and in HUD offices. 
In the last few years, the local housing authorities have been brought more actively into this partnership. I first recommended to Mr. Moses and Mr. Schuldiner that the housing authorities should be co-applicants in 1993-94, and it was in the authorizing legislation that died. The National Tenant Organization Conference in Puerto Rico last August was an example of the assistance provided by the Department. My role in this conference was no different from my role in other such resident conferences. That is, I was responsible for coordinating the HUD portion of the agenda. I coordinated the HUD speakers. Because the Puerto Rico conference, like other conferences, was sponsored by a private organization, my role in the overall planning and organization of the conference was limited. I first learned that a conference might take place in Puerto Rico in the spring of 1995, around the time that a group from Puerto Rico may, met in headquarters DC with someone in the secretary's office. I did not know that I had any responsibility or real role in this conference until June 1995 when my supervisor, Mr. Ed Moses, told me I would be attending the conference. It was, I think, around June 23rd. On June 26th, my supervisor instructed me to prepare a letter permitting the conference to be an eligible expense for public housing funds, allowable expense. I expressed to my supervisor on two occasions my opinion that I did not believe it was a good idea to have the conference in Puerto Rico. I stated to him around July of 1995 that the conference location could appear to be inappropriate. I expressed this belief the second time after viewing flyers distributed by Mrs. Green and after learning the press articles regarding the conference which mentioned HUD in Mr. Moses's office. I also expressed to my then supervisor on several occasions in the past that conferences run by Mrs. Green were not of the highest quality. At the time, I did not believe it was appropriate to express these beliefs to my supervisor or any other higher official any stronger or more often than I did. I am a career federal employee and I am expected to implement policy decisions which are not illegal without regard to my personal feelings connected to the wisdom of a project. Likewise, I did not believe it would have been appropriate to take any action to impede the conference. The decision whether I was to attend the conference was not within my power. I believe that I fully fulfilled my responsibilities as a career employee by informing my supervisor that the conference could be viewed as excessive and might cause problems for the department. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I will answer any questions you might have to the best of my ability. Uh, thank you. Before uh, recognizing Mr. Martini, I, I do want to recognize the fact that both of you have worked uh, many years in, in government service. Mr. M Moses, how many years have you worked? in government service for over 11 years. Right, and I know it's been a very distinguished career. Mrs. Arnardo, again, how many years in HUD? Tw uh, 21 years in HUD. Right, and I also want to acknowledge that um, you did not ask to be here, uh, that we requested you to be here, and that, that uh, you are here at our requirement. And we didn't do that lightly, and um, um, I think it's important to say, and that you willingly came once you were required to be here, and we thank you for your presence. Um, Mr. Martini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank both of the witnesses for uh, uh, their testimony. Mr. Mr. Moses, uh, I think uh, first let me let me ask this question: uh, Prior to this occasion, in terms of this NTO convention, had you worked previously with NTO on any other conventions? Uh, yes, sir, I have. I've worked in, with NTO. Uh, I have participated in NTO's conventions ever since I've came to the department. The first time was in, started in October, I believe it was October of 93, where the annual, the 27th annual conference. Right. So you had, uh, prior to uh, August or June of 1995, had uh, other uh, uh, dealings with NTO and with Maxine Green in particular, correct? When I, I, business dealings with respect to your job in terms of uh, NTO's functions and... I, and I've, let me let me be clear of the question, sir. Are you asking have I participated in their conferences, which I uh, before, or are you asking have I had dealings with her before? Well, I guess what I'm trying to do, uh, when did you first meet Maxine Green? And uh, let's let's begin with that. Do you have a recollection of the first year? Let's say the year you first met Maxine the Green. The first time I met Miss Green was sometime back in 1987, while I was at the Housing Authority of the, of New York City, when she came in to ask. 
that we uh, uh, support a conference uh, or an event that she was having down in uh, Washington, D.C. All right. And did you participate in any way uh, as the liaison between HUD and her in that, in that initiative? Uh, I was not a HUD employee at all at that time. I was an employee of the New York City Housing Authority. And no, sir, I did not coordinate that event, but I was, I, I was aware of it. I'm just trying to get a point of reference. Prior to this June uh, of 1995, in this particular convention, had you ever acted in a similar capacity with NTO? Uh, um, when I reported to HUD in August, uh, on August 16, 1993, uh, the secretary had set up an ad, an ad hoc advisory committee uh, to advise him uh, and to receive the resident's perspective on policies that, that uh, HUD was getting ready to implement. Mm -hmm. It was my responsibility to work with that ad hoc advisory committee to, uh, to uh, develop a policy paper on uh, HUD participation, I mean on residents' participation in HUD programs. Uh, the, the individual who who originally met with the secretary to uh, talk about these changes was, was uh, Mrs. Green and the National Tenant Organization. Uh, they met with him on June 2nd of 1993 uh, with Mr. Clyde McKinder when Mr. Uh, when the Mr. Secretary then uh, asked him to put together this policy paper. Uh, the, the group, he then referred it, as I understand it, uh, he then referred it to uh, let me just, uh, I don't mean, but I think here, my point is you, you had some dealings while you were an official at HUD with Ms. Green prior to this June 1995 uh, meeting about the convention, et cetera, correct? Yes, I have. Okay. And uh, one of the areas that was most troubling to me, quite uh, candidly, was the fact that, uh, can you correct me if I'm not mistaken, but the fact that in June of 1995 or thereabouts, there was this process going on between HUD and NTO with respect to uh, a voluntary debarment or suspension of her having uh, uh, participate with HUD in the multifamily housing program due to financial mismanagement, correct? That was in 1994. Okay. But the debarment did not actually take place till when? The voluntary arrangement between NTO and, and HUD? I believe it occurred in 1994. Uh, is that your best record? I, I'm not. I, I, the, so, so that in effect, then that's even. I thought it was closer in time to the June 1995 date, but you were aware of that when you were talking with Miss Green about this initiative in Puerto Rico, correct? Miss Green brought this this to our to our attention herself. All right, A and it would seem to me, if you were exercising the uh, kind of judgment that I think. Uh, uh, someone in your position uh, would be expected to exercise. Uh, wouldn't that have sent up a red flag uh, to you uh, that uh, this perhaps is not the timely moment to having this uh, HUD-NTO uh, relationship at a time when the uh, president or the uh, director of NTO was uh, on a debarment status with HUD for financial mismanagement? Uh, the 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 responsibility of my office is to work with, with resident organizations, duly elected resident organizations, both local, state, and national. Uh, in dealing with NTO, I was dealing with a national resident organization that represent a, num a large number of public housing residents. Uh, the debarment was against Ms. Green. It was not against NTO. And basically, uh, in considering whether or not to sponsor this trip, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, in considering whether or not to participate in this conference, it was basically looking to see whether or not NTO, uh, the conference was going to uh, present things that was in the best interest of the housing of, of the uh, of the agency, and whether they were going to be offering some substantive training to residents. Based on that determination, uh, we then proceeded to participate. You mentioned that the debarment was Miss Green, not NTO. Yes, Yet sir. it was Miss Green who you were talking to and meeting with, and no one else with respect to NTO. Correct? Uh, no, sir. That is not correct. Uh, generally, when we had meetings uh, of this nature, uh, we would would talk to representatives of different. We would talk to representatives of different national, state, and regional organizations. As a matter of fact, when we invited them to come to our conferences, we basically told them, 
them uh, come to our, our ad hoc committee meeting, we basically told them to bring two persons. We would pay for one. But I have to tell you that they brought numerous people with them. They are numerous board members with them. Mr. Moses, I direct your attention to the June 27, 1995 letter. Uh, you addressed that letter to Maxine Green, the woman who was on suspension from having dealings with the uh, HUD because of a voluntary debarment, correct? I, I, mean, I, address, I addressed the letter to the president of NTO. Well, you addressed the letter to the president of the MTO, and I'm factually accurate, who was suspended at that point from having dealings with HUD, correct? She was suspended. Nope. You, you she was not suspended. She was debarred, voluntarily was debarred. Voluntary debarred. Voluntarily uh, debarred. As, to, as my understanding of the matter is that she, was she had voluntarily debarred, us, debarred herself from participating in multi-housing activity. Right. That was the extent of, of the debarment as far as my understanding. The basis for that debarment was because of financial mismanagement, correct? Uh, I, didn't, I, I did not know at that time, no, sir. You did not know at the time that the basis for the debarment was because of allegations of financial misman mismanagement? No, sir. You, you've, um, uh, you wrote a letter on June 27th, uh, basically to Ms. Green, which was a day after a meeting, I believe. It was a meeting on, or a day after a letter you received from Ms. Green dated June 26th. And the letter you wrote back was to Ms. Green. And in the last paragraph, you said, uh, as HUD has indicated in the previous years for such resident training conferences, this NTO convention is an allowable training activity for resident leaders and their housing and authority partners for reimbursement under public housing funds, including but not limited to operating subsidy, comprehensive grant program, top or other HUD funds. Uh, what was the basis by what, what was the motivating factor for you to write this letter? Miss um, Green contacted me. Uh, previously uh, saying that, that some of the residents were having difficulty uh, accessing their funds to get to the conference because either the public housing authority uh, executive director or, or his or her designee or either the uh, HUD public housing uh, HUD field office uh, didn't, was not allowing people to go because they didn't have any official guidance. I then uh, told her that I was, would uh, supply the official guidance. Mr. Uh, Mr. Moses, um, this, this letter then assisted Ms. Green in uh, circulate, well, assisted her, um, strike that, it basically this letter um, was instrumental in assuring tenants that this would be an allowable expense, correct? I, I don't understand the question. Well, you indicated, and I accept your testimony, that you wrote this because Ms. Green had expressed some uh, concerns about tenants who had uh, discussed with her the difficulties of getting this uh, trip paid for out of either top funds or some other housing fund. Uh, and so your letter basically is authorization that those funds could be used for this uh, particular event, correct? Yes, sir. Right. And uh, had you ever previously written a letter like this for a, in, uh, for a uh, tenants organization meeting or a conference? Yes, sir. And before you wrote this letter, what actions did you take to assure or what policies were in place in HUD at the time for you to ensure that the sponsoring organization is a legitimate organization, what I mean, what I mean legitimate meaning what their legal status is, what is the nature of their program, uh, and what other, uh, what efforts did you take to make sure that the convention would be run in a manner consistent with HUD policies? The reason what? I ask that question I, is I'm because the investigation has indicated that the According to the Inspector General, the convention didn't come close to meeting a good number of HUD policies. The, what we basically do is to look at the, the agenda to determine if it meets uh, HUD's best interest and whether or not the, 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 the workshops are substantive, offer substantive training. 
if in fact they do offer sustainable training, uh, if it is if if the organization uh, is not is a nonprofit organization, we then uh, can without we then can can go ahead and begin to to offer our assistance. Okay. Aside from what you've testified to, was there any defined procedure um, th that uh, that you uh, knew you had to comply with before you yes, could sir. write that type of letter? Yes, sir. And uh, and is it your testimony here today that you complied with all of those yes, procedures? Sir. Yes, sir. And um, in listening to the testimony of yourself and Miss uh, Miss Arnado. Um, that's a pretty strong statement. Are you are you comfortable under oath making that statement? I, I just to, would like to you to repeat the question again because to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir, I do believe that I I I I, uh, I followed the actually followed HUD policy. Okay. I do believe that I did. Okay. Did did uh, I, excuse me, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, did you make inquiry of Miss uh, Miss Green at the time as to? Uh, uh, Obtaining a copy of the legal status of the NTL. To my under, to to my understanding, that was not one of, of the requirements. To my understanding, the requirement was whether or not uh, the test was whether or not the program offered was within the best interest of the department, and whether the training was substantive, because we were not asked to co-sponsor co the uh, the conference. We were only asked to participate. Would it would it matter uh, would it matter whether or not uh, a tenant organization is a for profit or a non profit? Yes, it would have. Right. So if that matters, what inquiry did you make to find out what the status was of NTL? The trigger the trigger for us was whether or not we were co sponsoring co sponsoring an organization to ask about their legal status. There are only two instances okay. uh, in which we we, we we were, t were to go t in that detail. One is if we were considering co-sponsoring an event, and secondly, if they were receiving a grant from the, ha from the, the department. Those are the only two instances. Um, in the interest of time and the patience of my colleagues, uh, I'll yield to the chairman, and thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to, uh, to recognize Mr. Towns. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, let me begin by thanking both of you for your, your testimony. And um, let me just sort of pick up on uh, one of the questions that was just asked. Um, please walk me through the steps that you took to determine that the NTO convention would be eligible for top and other public housing funds. And I guess adding on to that, did you do anything differently for NTO that you might have done for another group or other groups? Uh, the steps that we use are basically uh, we began to look at the proposed, uh, the proposed agenda. If the proposed agenda offers substantive training on public on a uh, uh, departments programs and if we determine that it is in the best interest of the the agency to participate in uh, this uh, in this workshop we then proceed to do so uh, NTO is a national resident organization it represents a large number of residents and therefore it would be of interest to, to the department to make sure that we get out information uh, on departments' policies and procedures and programs. After we, 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 uh, after we make that determination in this specific particular interest, I mean instance, uh, I then went to my supervisor and said that, that the NTO had asked us to participate in their program. And they, they have asked us to, that they wanted us to do specific workshop or specific trainings I thought that, that it was something that, that was eligible, and he concurred, and I proceeded to then say uh, to Ms. Green, yes, we will participate. Uh, this is basically the same step that we take with any organization coming to ask us to participate in their programs. Right. 
you know, I know you've heard some of the testimony that's gone on here before. Uh, who looked at the agenda? When was the agenda observed or looked at? And of course, who determined uh, whether or not the agenda actually met the criteria that you could be involved in? Uh, basically, we're, we're dealing with resident organizations. They are not, uh, we're not dealing with technical professional organizations. When Ms. Green called me, when Ms. Green called me, I basically asked Ms. Green what did she want us to do. She in then in turn told me that she wanted us to, to do workshops on our programs. She wanted us to do workshops on, on home ownership. She wanted us to do workshops on Section 3. She wanted us to do workshops on attendant opportunity programs. She wanted her to participate in a town hall session to explain the future of public housing. I then, at that turn, uh, asked her, told her that, that uh, those things are, are things that we, we, we have worked with her in the past on in her conferences, that, but she first had to do it, I sent an official letter in writing. She then sent an official letter in writing to me. Attached to it was a tentative working agenda. We looked at, at that working agenda and see whether, in fact, we, uh, the things that she asked for uh, for me to do in the telephone conversation was actually covered in that agenda. Uh, uh, I then, as I said before, went to my supervisor and said, this is what Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Green and NTO has asked of us. And then uh, and we, it, I, it is the same thing that they've asked us to do before. Uh, we, shall, we participated in it. He concurred. And I, we then made the decision to go forward with it. Let me um, ask you, Mrs. Bernardo, uh, did the NTO agenda include subjects that would assist residents in administering the top grant? Uh, yes. Why did HUD support the NTO convention, even though the agenda did not indicate that residents would learn, you know, how to administer the top grant? Well, you said they, they had a, a portion on it. But why would, I mean, was it not enough for you? I mean, I, I don't understand in terms of your comments. It was not enough information on it for you to feel comfortable or the fact that uh, the, the wrong folks were involved? I mean, I, can, I don't understand in terms of your reservations or your hesitation. Uh, can you explain my reservations or hesitations about what? About, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, you, first of all, you had problems coming here. Yes. I, I, I don't understand that. You know, I mean, uh, because of the fact that uh, all, we, all you had to do is come and testify in terms of as to what happened. I mean, in, why would you have hesitations or reservations if they had the top program, which is the grant that we're talking about, was a part of the agenda? I mean, wouldn't that sort of fit in terms of the guidelines as to why people should come and why they should learn and know what's going on? Uh, do you, we're talking about empowering people, aren't we? Uh, the, the agenda did not include that. Let me, let me, I'll, I'll, yeah, I want to make it very plain. The, uh -huh, I want to make sure. it very plain. You had reservations about coming here. Yes. It's my understanding that you are here because of a subpoena. Yes. And that you were requested to come and you refused to come. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure we go through yes. the steps. Uh, you indicated that the agenda included the top program. Is that correct? There was some information about the top program was a part of the agenda. Uh, the top program was one item on the agenda. Yeah. You also stated, according to uh, my recollection, uh, that you felt uncomfortable with the agenda, with the program, and uh, because of the fact that, uh, was it w w the fact that you didn't have enough input in the agenda, or was it the yeah. fact that the people that were involved in organizing it, that you had reservation and hesitation about them? I, I I'm didn't, asking two questions. Yeah, okay. Your reservation about coming and then the, right. the, the top program. My reservations about coming are stated in my testimony. I basically, as a career bureaucrat, was following decisions of my, my supervisors, and I didn't really want to comment on it uh, in a public forum. I was wanting to do it in uh, another way that would be as appropriate to get you all the information you needed. Uh, I have no problem in providing the information and the truth. What's your second question again? Well, no, I want to know in terms mm -hmm. of you indicated you had input in the agenda. 
Is that correct? The speakers and... and, and uh, I had, regarding the agenda, I had input into the HUD portion of the agenda, yes. Did you feel that that was adequately carried out uh, at the conference? The people that you asked to speak, mm -hmm. they came and did they speak? Yes. Yes, I, I felt that the HUD technical portion of the agenda, and I was there uh, only through about 3 o'clock on Monday, uh, the portion that I observed uh, and, and participated in actively was, was carried out and provided useful program knowledge, yes. And it was, uh, it was challenging because we did it both in English and Spanish. Uh, but we did talk about a variety of subjects besides the top grant program. The top grant program was only one small, small portion of the agenda. We talked about uh, resident participation, uh, some of the detailed subparts of the regulations, uh, uh, including conflict of interest, including uh, allowance for housing authorities to give residents space, uh, including exactly how you constitute uh, a, a duly elected resident council and, and, and go through an, uh, properly go through an election procedure, which all of them were doing. That was one whole section. We did a whole section, whole morning section on section three where we explained all the requirements of the regulations. We uh, explained all the requirements of uh, when our 51% uh, resident owned business could in fact bid. Then we had a couple of resident uh, leaders from Puerto Rico come up and explain how they had set up businesses in Puerto Rico. Uh, I, felt, I felt comfortable with that part of the agenda, well, yes. You know, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, mm -hmm. but I think that we have to ask, you know, some of, and I, I think that based on what mm -hmm. you said, and I, you know, it sounds very impressive to me, but the IG was here earlier, uh, found that the training value of the convention according to the IG was minimal, and that NTO organizing and political rallying, they said, in light of the conclusion, was HUD wrong in supporting the event? I mean, if this is what they're saying. Now, your assessment of it is different from that, is I, based on what you just said. Well, I thought the conference, it, to my knowledge, had uh, some positives. And uh, in my follow-up knowledge and being a part of the HUD team to assess the conference after the fact, I saw one video of the uh, morning session, uh, morning session, and I saw the Fox News, I saw some negatives too. I saw some positives, and I saw some negatives. Mm -hmm. You also indicated in, in terms of your being concerned about this conference being held in Puerto Rico. Yes. Why? Because a conference of poor people in Puerto Rico paying with taxpayers' expense, I thought would raise issues. That was my first concern, and that concern was raised to me by colleagues and staff, and that's why I raised it. Well, let me tell you, uh, you know, my views on this is that if we are serious about what we're doing, wouldn't you go to the large houses, uh, large housing authorities? Being you didn't go to New York, then the next place to go would be Puerto Rico. There, there were some technical program reasons why Puerto Rico was a valid site for a conference, including the fact that they had a large number of resident businesses and resident management corporations, yes. And they were a large community of public housing residents. Uh, there were some issues on the other side. On the other side was certainly the appearance problem, uh, perhaps the cost problem, and uh, is it better, and we've been looking at this more in retrospect, is it better to have targeted workshops in local areas? So that it, that there isn't as much expense to go, and uh, you can stretch your limited federal resources in a better way. Well, let me just say that you know. But I, I'm, I, I'm just telling you, and this is a retrospective. I, I understand opinion. that. I understand mm -hmm. that. I think that, uh, and I appreciate you know, you being so candid and coming forward and sharing. And let me tell you, I respect that. But l let us also look at what we're dealing with. We're saying that we want to empower tenants. Yes. We want them to be involved. Yes. So we have to make it attractive for them to be involved. You know, uh, I was uh, listening in terms of uh, just recently where they were trying to get young people to be immunized, and that they said to them that if you become immunized, we will give you a Michael Jackson ticket. You know what I mean? So I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, doing things to encourage people is not something new. I mean, and, and I think that we have to look at, even though we're dealing with the situation in terms of... Uh, 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 what we, you refer to as poor people. But the point is that 
I think we have an obligation, we're serious about what we're doing to elevate and to empower, that we have to use things and make certain it's attractive for them to be involved in it. I mean, uh, uh, and I think that those of us who are involved in leadership roles have to stand up. And I think that uh, in as much as there might have been some comments about it, I don't have a problem with you going to Puerto Rico. I mean, I, I, I don't, don't, I can't see it. And that's the thing. Let me just say even a step further. Uh, the flyer. I don't have a problem with the flyer. My problem, though, is that I'm hoping that whatever's being said here today is truthful. Because my concern, and I don't know what the concerns of the other members are, but let me just tell you what my concern is here. And I want to make it very clear for the record. My concern is simply this. We want to be able to have good tenant programs. We want to be able to empower tenants. We want to be able to do that. If there's something wrong, if we made a mistake along the way, let us correct the mistake and move forward. That's the, my, my concern here today. And that's my only concern. And that's the reason why I want to spend the time to be able to get this information on the record so that whatever the problems are, if there are problems, let us correct it. But I just don't want to make certain that we, because of somebody's criticism, we throw out everything that, you know, up to this point. Because I'm saying to you that this program has a great deal of value. I can show you developments in New York City that we're in, that you have tenant management that have been able to turn programs around, and HUD has been able to save a lot of money. And I'm preferred to, I'm ready now to call a roll and to tell you in some of those areas, which are in my district, that, that HUD is saving money because of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I don't want be, me to be timid about you know, talking about something of his positive. Uh, 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 Mr. Moses, I don't think that you know, if something is good, I don't think we should back up and, you know, on it. If, I mean, let's say what happened. I mean, let's let the record know and to reflect what happened. My only thing is to make certain that we're telling the truth on the record. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Um, I'm going to be very blunt. This convention was an outrage. It should never have been, it never should have happened. HUD should never have approved it. HUD should never have promoted it. And that is the way I feel. Now, to connect the fact that there was this convention and that I could raise questions about, and my colleague isn't saying this. I don't want to tie in. I'm just speaking from this whole hearing. To say that somehow questioning in any way the outrageousness of this convention would, would imply that we don't believe strongly in this opportunity program for tenants just doesn't match. The problem is that some communities used up five years of their grant to go to Puerto Rico for a convention that was not substantive. Now, how can, for travel, the travel portion, how can I say it wasn't substantive? Because I looked at a lot of the convention. I saw what happened. I saw it on film. The whole thing was recorded. The whole thing was recorded. And the reason why we're going to make some progress is nobody can deny what was on that film. And if there's anyone that needs to see what was on, what happened, all they have to do is watch it. Now, you all are here for two different reasons. Mr. Moses, you're here because I found your testimony Moni, last time, not helpful, not direct, and misleading. That's why you're here. Uh, Ms. Arnardo, you're here because you showed up partly on our, our radar screen because of this email, which we need to talk about. And um, you just have to be here after an email like that, and I think you understand. It's not my general practice to ask someone under someone to come in. It really isn't. Um, I'm not questioning the dedication of either of you, and, and I'm not, I'm simply not, I know you're both very dedicated people. I'm questioning with the fact that we're not facing up to the mistakes, and we're not, and, and, and what I really believe was this committee was misled, and I won't stand for it for a minute. I mean, we just can't. I, we have to establish that when people come before this committee, they simply tell us the truth, then we evaluate it, and we let the chips fall where they may, and somebody may get criticized. There's not a person in this place who doesn't have something they can be criticized for. Me included, this gentleman, many things, and we get it. Now, I just need to go through a few things. Um, I need to understand why both of you approved this convention as a viable use of federal dollars for training. 
This was not to, supposed to be, the training funds are not to, to, to just be a fairly blasé, let's inform people. They're supposed to teach, they're supposed to instruct, they're supposed to improve, not just give people more knowledge, they're supposed to change behavior, and so on and so on and so on. They're not supposed to be a political rally, they're not supposed to be a paid vacation. Now, you all have the requirement. Now, Mr. Moses, you have the ultimate authority because Mrs. Arnardo, Ms. Arnardo, it comes under you. And you really have to take the responsibility. That's, that's your responsibility. You can't pass it on to somebody else. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir, and I have no intention of okay. passing anything well, I ju on we anybody just, else. We just need to establish that point. Now, HUD has certain requirements before they allow for federal dollars to be used, before HUD will be associated with an, an activity. What are those requirements, Mr. Moses? It is my understanding that there are certain different triggers that, 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 that ignite, that sort of stimulate those requirements. First is, is that HUD must make a determination that, what, that if someone is asking you to participate in an event, you must make a determination that it's in the best interest of HUD. If you interest of HUD and that, is, that, that it offers substantive training, then you can, you can, begin, you can participate in that process. However, the test that you do for that is differs for a for-profit group and a not-for-profit group. Okay, and is that the extent of what you have to do? If, if the test, as I said before, if, if it's a for-profit group, uh, if, it is, if it's for a for-profit group, uh, you then must do a, 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 a deep investigation into the trip and make a, a written determination. If, in fact, it is not a for-profit group, it is not necessary to do a written determination of that. There is a lot more requirements than that, and it's troubling that, that you would not know that. My, my, underst my understanding is that, that there are different requirements for different, whether it is a for-profit group or whether it isn't that, for-profit group, no. and certain those things to be ignite certain triggers. Yes, sir. And, and in fact, if, or either if you are co-sponsoring a group, uh, uh, an, an event, it also sort of touch off certain triggers. Uh, those triggers, again, is looking to see whether or not uh, the activities are illegal or, or, or if, uh, if they are in the best interest of the agency. And in addition to that, if you determine that it is a for-profit group or if that there it looks as if we are promoting the group, then you must out seek the, uh, the OGC's approval, which is the Office of General Counsel. But um, all of these are ignited by a series of triggers. Um, Ms. Arnardo, what, what would be uh, some of the requirements that have to be met before HUD would allow uh, federal dollars to be used uh, and before even federal employees are allowed to participate in, a, in an event? Uh, before I say anything, I sure. have to say that the, the requirements for these are in, a, are in a series of letters that were distributed sometimes only to principal staff, not widely disseminated and a little bit confusing. Okay. Uh, so that, uh, and, and in practice, uh, HUD staff probably over the years I've known have not gone through a, a rigorous examination of these procedures when approving staff to participate okay. in conferences. Um, and these overlay with the uh, new proactive requirements were started when I worked for Jack Kemp okay. uh, to be proactive with resident leaders in, in, in um, doing training activities. But the requirements basically deal with looking as if it's, this is the best way to do training, how high the registration fee is, whether you're promoting the conference, and uh, 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 if in fact there, is, there are some of these indications, then um, not only are you required to go to the uh, uh, through your normal approval process, but you're also supposed to get the concurrence of the general counsel. 
did the general counsel approve um, uh, two things? One, uh, the use of um, top money for this conference, and two, did the general counsel approve the participation of HUD employees? Mr. Moses? Uh, no, no, they did not, sir, and that, that is because it was not required as according to our understanding. It's in the procedure, sir, but it isn't uh, followed it isn't in practice. practice. Yeah. Okay. It isn't followed in practice. Uh, when travel or things were signed off, uh, they weren't, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't followed. Thank you. Um, June 17, 1994, uh, Nelson Diaz, general counsel, had subject employee participation in privately sponsored conferences and workshops. Are, are both of you or either of you uh, familiar with that requirement, that, that, that document? <coughs> Mr. Moses? I, I am aware that that, that document uh, is, 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 was submitted by, uh, was put out by the general counsel. Okay. Uh, I became uh, aware of it. Uh, when I became aware of it uh, when we uh, began to look into this process. Uh, I, yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Renato, I, I just need to know if you are aware of that, that document. Um, n not at the time, but after, not at the time, not but the I'm time. aware of it. I'm aware of it now, and I'm involved in writing more clear-cut procedures so that we are aware of all these, uh, all these uh, steps yeah. that we must go through. The, the, the first recommendation of the IG uh, was that HUD needs to strengthen its internal controls to better assure adherence to its policies or participation in outside conferences and conventions. And um, I mean, that seems fairly clear from just the response of the two. Mm -hmm. Neither of you are very clear, it seems to me, on what all the rules and requirements are. And it would seem to me you would know it pretty well. Um, I'm, I have some reluctance because it's, you know, I said, he said, but I, I need to just have some sense of the fact that, that we have, I have the opinion that the National Tenants Organization should not be in business with HUD after seeing what they've done. I have the opinion that they certainly shouldn't be promoted by HUD. And I am troubled by one page in that flyer. And Mr. Moses, I need, because you are under oath, it's not against the law that you saw it. It just says something about how you viewed it. And maybe with hindsight, you would view it differently. Um, I need to know when you saw this document. And I need to know if, in fact, other people in your office didn't tell you that there was a document like this that included uh, a whole page describing uh, the vacation you could have going to this convention? To my recollection, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, the first time that I saw that document was uh, on when the councilman gave it to us, faxed it to me. After there, the event or before the this event? This was before the event. Okay. Uh, uh, they happened somewhere around August 10th. That's to my election. And the event I, took place on August 20th to the 24th? Yes, sir. That is my, my first recollection of seeing the document. Okay. Now, I, Mr. Ar Mr. Moses, I understand that sometimes some things can happen you know, don't remember. Uh, Ms. Ms. Ar Arna Arnardo, uh, you saw this document when? To the I best saw this document in Ed Moses' office when he called me in and asked me if I had seen it, and I said no. And he told me he had just uh, talked to Maxine Green about it. In fact, okay. he said he chewed and, her and out. And when was, when was that? Uh, that was approximately this time. I can't recollect this the This time being what? Uh, around August 10th. I see. Um, it would be encouraging to know that, Mr. Moses, that you might have gotten mad at seeing this document. I, I would have liked to have known that. I, 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 I did get mad when I, I saw the document. I, I, as a matter of fact, I had a very uh, frank conversation with Ms. Green about the tone of the document. Uh, how, would, how would we have known that from your last testimony before this committee? Uh, I, I, was, I was not asked whether I, I, I talked to Mrs. Green about it. And I was just trying at the last committee just to, to state the facts about when I saw the document. Yeah. Problem is, you had your superior here, and in essence, this convention was defended 
by you and your superior uh, when it seems to me you could have been much more candid? I mean, if you were candid with Maxine Green, you could have been candid with us. Mr. Chairman, I, I thought I was candid uh, because, frankly, uh, I thought the question was, when had I seen the document? No, that's, I, also, that's I also wanted to know about the convention, what you thought about the convention, what you thought about the flyer, et cetera. Okay. Now, um, this was a National Tenants Organization convention. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. This was a convention that would have happened whether or not HUD had uh, allowed it to be a training program. Is this not correct? This would have happened uh, whether or not HUD had sent out a letter. Okay. Is it likely that they would have had as many people attend this convention? I would if, not. If, if HUD had not uh, promoted it and authorized it? and allowed people to take, uh, to be, have it be paid for with government money? Excuse me, sir. They, those are a series of questions. I'm sorry. It is. Could you, I, uh, uh, yeah. could you let, just, let just do one at a time, yeah. please? The, the problem I have, and I'll get that right down to it, I have problems with HUD basically promoting the NTO, uh, a, uh, an organization which we're not sure whether it was nonprofit or, or profit at the time. Um, but my problem is this. You promoted it. HUD promoted this, this organization. It's separate from the training. This was an organization. This is the convention they would have had whether there was training or not. It, it would have happened. HUD assisted in bringing a number of people to that convention. Isn't that true? Uh, in hindsight, based on some of the things that I've seen, uh, one could conclude that. No, we but don't need to be cute. I mean, no. this is no, this is being cute now. No. I'm not trying to be, and I don't want you to be. I, I just need to establish some basic facts. The basic fact is that this was a convention that, you know, we had my colleagues on both sides of the aisle describe what happens in conventions. I know that happens in conventions. What I don't like is the fact that HUD basically paid people to go there to have those things that happen in conventions. I don't have a problem with HUD paying to give people substantive training. I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. I have a problem with HUD paying to have people go to conventions that promote a particular organization. Then I have a big problem. Uh, we, we, I have that problem too, sir, but at the time when we were looking at, at, at the, con at the uh, conference, at the time when we were looking at the conference, we were, we were basically asked we were basically asked to perform certain training functions. And my decision was based on, on performing those certain training functions and also looking at what was described in their brochure. They described that they were going to be offering uh, training on organizing and things of that nature. Yeah, let, me, let me just tell you the absurdity. HUD can participate if the meeting is substantive. You, have two, you had two basic decisions. One, whether you could participate, and another, whether it was reimbursable whether you as an employee could participate and be a part of it. The other was whether you would allow taxpayers' dollars to be used by tenants to go there. Yes, sir. And we're not talking about little dollars. We're talking oh, close to 300, over $300,000. Now, you had two basic decisions. And this is the, the, the kind of the, 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 the challenge I have. HUD can participate if the meeting is substantive. That's one of the requirements. And the meeting was only substantive because HUD participated. HUD can pay expenses if the meeting is substantive, and the meeting was only substantive because HUD was there. Basically, you all were the ones providing the training. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke. I mean, if you hadn't been there, there wouldn't have been any training. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, that, that, that in, in, again, in hindsight, that, that some of that may have been true, but, but during it, I mean, when we begin to make decisions about this, Based on conversation, based on what is presented to us, uh, okay. Let me. We didn't. I, I, there was no way I could foresee that. Okay. Let me just say this to you. Um, I realize that I can look at it after the fact. Before the convention happened, you saw a flyer that you didn't like, and and I'm 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 making that assumption based on Miss Arno's testimony as well. Mm -hmm. That the first time you learned was when. Excuse me. You you received this flyer earlier but you don't recall seeing it? No, sir. Okay. Isn't it the requirement of HUD, isn't one of the requirements that they look at all materials sent out? 
Isn't that to, one of the requirements? To, to my understanding, that, that is a trigger only if, in fact, only if, in fact, it is a number one a for-profit organization. And mm -hmm. if we are co-sponsoring okay. the event. My understanding is that that's not correct. My mm -hmm. understanding is that you have to examine all material sense. So, I mean, and I, and I realize that you all weren't a, don't seem to be un, uh, connected with the memo and the requirement. But your requirement is to look at what material is being sent and to approve it. Your requirement is also to get the councils uh, okay uh, on, in terms of participation. So I am just saying to you, and I'm just going to end it here and just get to the one last item, and hopefully we can deal with it quickly. I'm just saying that the bottom line for me is that HUD has to look at what is being sent out, and HUD has to approve it if HUD is involved. I, I, I I, I now agree with that, sir, yeah. based on all the things that have, have occurred. Uh, those, I mean, those things, I mean, based on the things that occurred, I think it will put HUD in a better position if it does do that. Uh, Ms. Arno, uh, one of the reasons, um, Arnado, I'm sorry, uh, one of the reasons you're here is there, there is this email. Um, we may regret emails in this day, but uh, I need you to, to, to really describe to me all the components of it. I'd like you to read it, and I'd like you to then explain it to me. You know the email I'm referring to? Uh, yes. I have to get it. It's, uh, we have it if you don't have it. It's uh, dated 11 to 95, 538. I'll read it. No, I'll okay. read it. Why don't we'll get it. Wait a second. So here we'll do. We'll do I that. I here you go. Do. Take your time, and here it is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Read okay. it slowly and explain okay. to us who the participants are. Who is it sent to? Who is it uh, from? The memo was sent from me on 11-2 at 5:38 to Paula Blunt, Who's acting that? deputy assistant secretary right. for community relations and involvement. Okay. Uh, subject testimony: Chris Warren, now, executive that? assistant to Kevin Marchman, okay. mentioned we should at least try to have input into the testimony of Bertha Gilkey and Maxine Green. I know what there. I'm not a good typist, EIR issues are generally, but we want to discuss how we propose what PIH Kevin wants. Let's discuss. Okay, what does that mean? What's that all about? Okay. Uh, Chris Warren asked me to obtain the testimonies of the parties, uh, including the Inspector General, which I didn't mention right. here, uh, Bertha Gilkey and Maxine Green. Uh, my understanding was to understand, uh, for instance, issues that might come up as a part of our briefing material. Yeah. Uh, and I dutifully followed up. And I talked to Frank Kowaleski and John Gergowski in the Inspector General's office, and they told me that they were still redrafting it, and they provided to us the day before the hearing. Mm -hmm. I called Bertha Gilkey and uh, uh, after several attempts, uh, I was told that, her, that she was providing her testimony and she would provide it shortly before the hearing. I called Maxine Green and she said two things. She said, number one, that uh, she didn't understand because she didn't have the program knowledge to testify and I faxed her Who the law and the regs, Maxine Green. Okay. And Could you uh, explain what, uh, uh, not the program knowledge, what do well, you mean? She read your first letter, and it said, comment on the oversight, abuses, and so forth. And she said she wasn't a program specialist. She okay. couldn't comment on it. Okay. And uh, so I faxed her. She had asked my staff, and it hadn't been done. I faxed her the law and the regulations. Uh, I called her back dutifully to do the same thing, and she said she wasn't going to testify. Say the last point again. And she said she wasn't going to testify. Okay. Explain that. I don't understand. She told me she wasn't going to testify. Okay. Okay. That she was, I you, don't recall anymore. I understand. I understand. Do either, I, she in fact didn't because she wasn't feeling well and the record right. will show that. Um, pardon me. I'm sorry, did you have any more, uh, any more conversation that you wanted to describe with her? Uh, you had, you've had a number of conversations with her. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I've had a number of conversations. One lasted 20 minutes, one lasted 29 minutes, one right. lasted 19 minutes. Right. And I, I these, talked... These are records that right. come from HUD, correct? Yes. These yes, are I provided records. my telephone yeah. records. Yes, these are the telephone records 
that you provided us. Yes, I generally uh, I did extend my day beyond my normal 12 hours, yes, and I did talk, did did follow up and return a lot of calls during the evening. Uh, I had um, calls to Maxine Green just before and just after your hearing, including the time of the first furlough, related to uh, a great many issues that you had raised, anticipating some of them, which we didn't have the answers for at the hearing, like <laughs> registration number of people from Detroit and so forth, uh, but also issues of the, uh, uh, the letter on co-sponsorship, uh, issues, uh, the letter on, on Puerto Rico co-sponsorship, uh, which I knew nothing about until yeah until we were working on your hearing. So the record will show us basically we're following up on information yes. that we requested. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions. Do you, do you, do you want to? Uh, do either of you have any comments that you want to make before we get to our last panel? And we don't expect the last panel to last very long. Uh, Mr. Moses? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I'd like to say that this has been a, a very, very uh, rough experience for me. I, I have been in this business for a long period of time and I have never ever uh, been have to go through a process like this. Mm -hmm. um, I have always been a person of integrity. I have ever intended to mislead anyone. I have never tried to mislead anyone. I always tried to do is stick to the facts. I never ever tried to, to impart my opinions on things uh, in professional proceedings. Uh, never have I, I, as I said before, but have ever received anything uh, I've been involved in anything of this nature. Uh, yes, if, in fact, that, that uh, the uh, committee do feel that, that basically I was not truthful before, it wasn't my intent not to be truthful. I was just stating what I, I was aware of. And as, thing has un as these things have unfolded, I find that there are a lot of things that, that uh, basically uh, maybe we should have taken some, a lot closer look at some stuff. But during this, during this time frame, I was actively out on HUD business. Uh, from the, from May 30th through the end of of, uh, of August, I, if I was in my my office more than two to three times during that period, uh, it would be amazing to me. So again, I, I'm not I don't want to shuck my responsibilities because they were my responsibilities, uh, but in, this was and this is something that we 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 generally do on a regular basis, and we basically look at this as as something that we just regularly do, and and that was one of the reasons why we did not focus. I did not focus totally on it. Appreciate your statement, and I'll say uh, uh, this committee appreciates both of you being here. I know it hasn't been easy for either of you for different reasons. I know you both are very devoted public servants, and um, uh, whatever pain uh, gets involved in this process, uh, I have sympathy for that. I mean that sincerely. Uh, I hope we don't have to repeat this again in the future. I, I, I just hope we only can have when we only need one hearing. I hope we only have one hearing, and uh, unfortunately, we needed two hearings. And um, so I thank you very much for being here. Mr. Thank Thomas? you. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to say to thank both of them for the testimony and to uh, uh, say that I really appreciate, uh, uh, you know, hearing your comments at the end there, uh, because you're saying, in essence, that, sure, mistakes were made, and if you had an opportunity to do it over, you would do it differently. And I think we all respect that. And I also thank you, uh, Mrs. Arnato, for, uh, for coming, you know. Uh, and uh, I must admit that you were a very strong witness, and, uh, and I know that you... Uh, we're hesitant to come, but I tell you that I think that you made an outstanding witness, and I just want to say that as I look at this, Mr. Chairman, I know you keep saying, you know, uh, uh, this was a bad idea, but I think that they were serious, because any time you go to Puerto Rico in August, you must be serious. <laughs> <laughs> the record will also note, um, uh, Mrs. Arnardo, that uh, you did make recommendations for improving the top program, and um, those recommendations are in the record, and we appreciate that as well. I hope you both have a nice evening. Thank you. Appreciate the patience of our witnesses, particularly uh, Mr. Kevin Marshman, who is now our fourth panelist. And uh, we don't expect that we will have a long time, and uh, we'll be able to get you home, Mr. Marshman, and others as well. And if you just stay standing, Mr. Marshman, because as we do, we, you raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Mr. Marshman. Uh, for the record, uh, the witness answered in the affirmative. And uh, Mr. Marshman, uh, 
you are uh, welcome to <coughs> give any uh, statement you want. Uh, your full statement will be inserted in the record if that is your desire. I mean, it will be. And uh, you're, you can proceed any way you like. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Towns, members of the committee, good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee and correct what we must. I'd like to do that by highlighting my written testimony by covering briefly five central points. First, I think you will agree that the top program, as designed, is and will be a strong vehicle to provide residents the opportunity toward self-sufficiency and economic independence. At the time in which public housing authorities are moving toward market principles, the top program is essential. Unfortunately, the top program has been intertwined with the NTO conference held in Puerto Rico, and that is HUD's fault. Second, with respect to the NTO conference and the role HUD played in it, at the last hearing, I told you HUD's role was small. I gave you the impression that we had little to do with the planning and its execution. I was wrong to tell you that because it was not true, and for that I take responsibility. I know now through my own efforts, this committee's efforts, the IG, that the HUD role was large and involved. We gave NTO full access to our staff and our resources. We allowed ourselves, through good intentions, to violate, violate our own guidelines concerning such matters. In short, we blew it. Third, once we were made aware of the brochure and the perception and the impression and the problems it would leave, and knowing in large part that tax dollars were at play here, we should have pulled our support or at least immediately reassessed our involvement. We did not. Because we did not pull our support, we should have made sure the activities, the sessions of the conference were meaningful, informative, and accordance to our own guidelines. We did not. All of this could have been avoided if we would have been more careful, diligent, and yet exercise better judgment. While it was NTO's conference, our de facto sponsorship tied us in a way in which we cannot distance ourselves. I accept the blame for that. Fifth, and most importantly, what can we do to make sure that this does not happen again? As you will see in my written testimony, we have followed the five actions recommended by the Inspector General. We're developing a guidance on HUD participation in conferences in which HUD funds and programs are significantly involved. We have sent the letter to the Puerto Rican Housing Authority. We have identified three instances where staff improperly claim reimbursement and to ensure against further violations, we sent out a clarifying notice on travel reimbursement for HUD staff and will ask for reimbursement. We have set into motion the groundwork to make a final determination relative to administrative sanctions, if warranted, with regards to the National Tenant Organization. We have not established that any HUD staff assisted outside parties in preparation for congressional testimony, but have advised staff of the inappropriateness of such action. We have gone beyond the specific actions recommended by the IG. Some you heard today from, uh, from staff. We're developing guidance to residence organizations on the do's and don'ts of sponsoring conferences, both for HUD and for resident organizations. We are trying to make stronger the top program by developing performance standards to promote program results, developing issuance to register all consultants in the program, and trying to improve the real monitoring of the program. You also see from my written testimony the reorganization of the Office of, Resident of Community and Resident Involvement. Again, the top program is extremely important and very unique. It is the sole program in which we HUD fund directly to the residents. We have to be aware of that, and if changes need to be made, we will make so. I appreciate the opportunity you have given me to come back to verify or correct the record and I'm prepared to answer questions that the committee might have. I've asked Mike Janice, my general deputy, to accompany me this evening to assist in answering questions that I cannot. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Marshman, when did you assume your position? It was um, early October of last year. So it, you assumed your position after uh, this uh, convention took place? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
So when you say that you, you take responsibility, uh, you're talking about it in terms of, of giving this committee a clearer position of, of what actually took place. Yes, sir. Uh, you basically were in, in office how many m uh, weeks before you had to appear before this committee? I think it was four weeks. Yeah. Well, I think um, it is important that HUD set the record straight, and it's important uh, that you, as the person representing what took place given even though you weren't there it came through your words that you set the record straight and uh, I have tremendous respect for for you and also your statement um, and um, I feel it will be very helpful to this committee uh, also to say to you that uh, why Ed's not sure he wants to do a lot more hearings because we've had 31 so far uh, we intend to uh, go to one or two places uh, to seek out where tenants are really making a difference because it is the intention of this committee to promote this program, not to, to bring it down. Uh, it's the intention to protect this program from abuse. Uh, and so we will jointly be determining where we will go, but uh, I agree with you. This is a very important program. Mr. Towns. First of all, let me associate myself with, uh, with the chairman's remarks. We don't do this too often. But I would like to be associated with uh, his remarks and to also just to add that I'm happy to hear, you know, that uh, you're not pulling back from the top program, but you want to move to try and, and strengthen it. And I think that uh, you indicated in a very eloquent fashion that, you know, you moving forward to, to make the necessary corrections. I want to let you know that I respect that and I, I'm happy to hear, you know, you make those comments. Uh, and I'm certain that as you uh, continue in your capacity, I'm certain that a lot of things that, uh, you know, uh, will probably, uh, you look at them as you go along and make the changes. I appreciate, you know, you coming out again and, and letting us know in terms of your, your views after you found out additional information. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming up for your testimony today. And also well, thank you for your willingness to to be last. Usually we take a HUD official of your rank and, and, and so on as our first witness, but we felt it was important to establish what's taken place. So you've been very cooperative with the committee. We appreciate your statement. We appreciate what you're trying to do. And I also will say that this committee has tremendous respect for Ms. Mr. Cisneros. Uh, he has limited funds in which he's required to do a lot, and I happen to think he's done an excellent job. I don't know what Ed thinks. I, I think the same thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, with that, um, is there any other... Okay. And I look forward to working with you in, in terms well. of strengthening these kind of programs because I am totally committed to this concept. Uh, any advice your, uh, your, your office can give us on, on uh, tenant organizations that we should highlight and so on, we'd like to do that. And uh, with that, we adjourn this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good statement. Excellent statement. Excellent. Here's a look at campaign 96 coverage. Tonight at 10 Eastern and Pacific time, you'll see an election night broadcast from WIS-TV in Columbia, South Carolina, with results from the state's primary. And on Sunday at 7 p.m. on Road to the White House, a review of Saturday's South Carolina primary and a look ahead to upcoming...